Stone of Tears by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 213. Although I would agree that that is disastrous for me, how could you? It's what you want. It is what we had to do, but you have threatened my life. You have threatened the lives of anyone else who keeps that collar around your neck. That would be all the Sisters of the Light. I never take the warnings of wizards, even untrained wizards, lightly. Your use of the gift, allowing us to find you, could end up being a disaster for all of us. He felt no satisfaction that his threats had not gone unnoticed. He felt nothing. Then why are you doing this, he whispered, making me wear it. To help you, you would have died otherwise. You have already helped me. The headaches are gone. You have my thanks. Why can't you let me go now? If the collar is removed too soon before you learn enough of controlling the gift, they will come back. You will die. Then teach me so I can get it off. We must be cautious in teaching magic. You must have patience in your studies. We are careful in our training because we know more of the dangers of magic than you, and we don't want you to be hurt through ignorance. But that is not a problem for now, because it will take time before you are advanced enough to really use the gift and risk these dangers as long as you adhere to what we say. You can have patience, yes? I have no desire to use magic. I guess that could be construed as patience. Good enough for now. We will begin then. She squirmed a little, rearranging her legs. There is a force within us all. It is the force of life. We call it Han. Richard frowned. Lift your arm. He did as she asked. That is the force of life given us by the Creator. It is encased within you. You have just used Han. Those with the gift can extend that force outside themselves. Such an external force is called a web. Those with the gift, like you, have the ability to cast a web. With the web, you can do things outside your body, much as the life force can do within your body. How can that be? Sister Verna picked up a small stone in her fingers. Here my mind is using Han to make my hand lift the stone. My hand is not doing it of its own accord, but rather my mind is directing the life force to use my hand to accomplish what my mind wishes done. She set the stone back on the ground and folded her hands in her lap. The stone floated into the air and hung between them. I have just accomplished the same thing, only this time I did it by projecting the life force outside of my body. That is the gift. You can do what a wizard can? No, only some of it. That is how we are able to teach its use. We understand the feel of it. The sisters have some control of the life force and the gift, but nothing like a wizard who knows how to control his Han. How do you get this life force to go outside your body? That can't begin to be explained until you learn to recognize the force within yourself, learn to touch the Han. Why? Because every person is different. Every person uses the force differently. It isn't used the same in any two people. Love is a form of Han being projected outside oneself into another. It is, though, a very mild, weak form. Even though love is universal, it is used and felt differently by all. Some use it to bring out the best of the Han in another. Some use it to bring out the best in themselves. Some use it to control, to dominate another. It can heal or wound. Once we understand how the gift works within you, how you use it, we can guide you through exercises called forms. The forms are a method of practice that will help you learn to control the power once it is free of your body. But for now, that is not important. First, you must learn to feel the Han within yourself before you can project it anywhere outside your body. After you are able to touch the Han, then we must discover what it is you can do with it. Every wizard is different, and uses Han differently. Some can use it only through the use of mind, like wizards who study the prophecies. The use of their Han to understand prophecies is the major way the gift manifests itself with them. It is their unique talent. Some can only use their Han to create beautiful, inspiring objects. Some use their Han to create things invested with magic. It is their unique talent, how they are able to express Han. Some are able to use their thoughts to influence the world about them, as I showed you when I lifted the rock. Some can do other things with Han. Some are able to do a little of everything. 
Her frown returned. The truth is of the utmost importance in this, Richard. You must be completely truthful in telling us how the Han feels within you. Lying will cause grave difficulty. She relaxed a bit. But first, you must be able to call upon your Han before we can discover what sort of wizard you are. I told you I don't want to be a wizard. I just want to learn to control the gift so I can stop the headaches and get this collar off my neck. You said I didn't have to be a wizard. Controlling Han with the gift is what it means to be a wizard. When you learn to control it, you will be a wizard. That is the very essence of a wizard. But wizard is only a word. You should not fear a word. If you choose not to use the gift, that is your business. We can't force you. But a wizard you will be. Teach me what I need to know, but I'll not be a wizard. It is not something evil, Richard. It is just learning to know yourself, what you are capable of, what your talents are. Richard sighed. Fine. So how do I control it? Teaching control of the gift is a process taken in steps. I cannot explain it to you all at once because you would be unable to understand steps further along. Each step must be mastered before you can move on to the next. Before we can show you how to project the Han outside yourself, you must first recognize it and then be able to touch it, join with it within yourself. You must know what it is. You must be able to feel it. You must be able to reach for it, touch it, at will. You understand what I am saying, yes? Richard nodded. A little, I guess. So what is it? How will I know it? What is it like to know it, to touch it? Sister Verna's eyes became distant, seeming to go out of focus. You will know it, she whispered. It is like seeing the light given off by the Creator. It is almost like joining with Him. Richard watched her glazed expression. She seemed enthralled by what she was seeing within herself. So how do I find it? he asked at last. Her eyes focused on him. You must search for it within yourself. How? You simply sit and search within. You put all other thoughts aside and seek the quiet, the calm within yourself. At first it is helpful if you close your eyes, breathe slowly, evenly, and let yourself find the peace of nothingness. In the beginning it helps to focus on a single thing in order to exclude all distracting thoughts. A single thing? Like what? She shrugged. Whatever you wish. It is only a device to help you reach the end, not the end in itself. Everyone is different. Some use a single word, repeating it over and over to the exclusion of all else. Some use a mental picture of a simple object, using it to bring their mind into focus. Eventually, after you learn to recognize the power, to touch it and become one with it, you won't need to focus on a device first. You will know the nature of Han and be able to reach directly for it. It will become second nature to you. I know it sounds strange and difficult to you now, Richard, but in time you will find it as easy as it is for you to call forth the magic of your sword. Richard had the uneasy feeling that he already knew what she was talking about. He could almost understand what she was saying. The words seemed strange, but they described something that was somehow familiar, yet different. So you just wish me to sit and close my eyes and seek the quiet within? She nodded. Yes. Sister Verna pulled her heavy brown cloak tighter around her shoulders. You may begin. Richard let out a breath. All right. He closed his eyes. It seemed his thoughts were scattering in all directions at once. He tried to herd them away. He tried to think of a word or a picture to focus on. He thought of Kalin's name before anything else. He let it flow like liquid through his mind. Kalin. He rejected the idea. He hated his magic and didn't want to associate her with anything he hated. Besides, the thought of her only brought pain. The pain of loving her enough to give her what she wanted, of having set her free. He thought of simple words, simple objects, but none held any interest for him. He calmed his mind and relaxed his breathing. He sought peace within himself, a calm center, the way he had always done when he needed to think of a solution to a problem. In the quiet, he tried to think of an image he could use. It popped into his mind almost of its own accord. The sword of truth. It was already magic, and therefore he wouldn't be tainting it. It was a simple image. It seemed to fit the requirements. It was settled. It would be the sword of truth. Richard pictured it floating by itself on a field of black. He studied the details he knew so well. The polished blade with the fuller down its length, 
the aggressive downswept cross guards, the hilt covered in fine twisted silver wire, with twisted gold wire woven through it forming the raised letters of the word truth. As he pictured it, fixing it in his mind, floating on a black background, something fought him. It was the background, not the sword. Around the edge of the black was white, forming the black into a square. Richard remembered it from before. It was one of the instructions in the Book of Counted Shadows, the book he had memorized when he was a boy. Clear your mind of all thought, and in its place put nothing but the image of white with a square of black in its center. It was part of the instructions for removing the covers from the boxes of Orden and using the magic of the book. He had used that magic to show Darken Rahl how to remove the cover from a box to prove to him he truly did know the book. But why would it be in his mind now? Just a random memory forcing its way to the surface, he decided. It was as good a background as any to put the sword on. After all, he was trying to use magic. If his mind wanted to use it, it made no difference to him. He would let it be. At that thought, the image of the sword and a square black background with white around it solidified and became still. Richard concentrated on the mental image of the sword against the black square with the white border. He concentrated as hard as he could. Something began to happen. The sword, the black square, and the white border all began to shimmer as if seen through heat waves. The solid form of the sword softened. It became transparent, and then it was gone. The background dissolved. He was looking into a place he knew, the Garden of Life at the People's Palace. Richard thought it odd and somewhat annoying that he wasn't able to hold his concentration enough to keep the image of the sword in his mind. The memory of the place where he killed Darken Rahl must have been so strong that it forced its way into his mind while he was relaxed. He was about to try to force the image of the sword to come back when he smelled something. Burned flesh. The stench made his nostrils flare. He almost gagged. His stomach turned sickeningly. He searched the image of the Garden of Life. It was like looking through a dirty window pane. There were bodies lying over the short walls, fallen, partly hidden in bushes and sprawled on the grass. All were hideously burned. Some held weapons, swords, or battle axes in charred fists. Others lay with open hands, their weapons resting where they had tumbled as their owners fell dead. Choking apprehension swelled in Richard's chest. Richard saw the back of a white glowing figure standing before the stone altar before the three boxes of Orden. One of the boxes stood open, as Richard remembered. The white figure with long blonde hair lifted his face away from the boxes. Dark and Rahl turned and looked right into Richard's eyes. His blue eyes glowed. A smile spread slowly on his lips. It seemed as if Richard was helplessly pulled closer, closer to the grinning face. Darken Rahl lifted a hand to his mouth and licked the tips of his fingers. Richard, he hissed, I'm waiting for you. Come watch while I tear the veil. Unable to draw a breath, Richard slammed the image of the sword back into his mind like slamming a door. He held it there, rigidly, without the background, as he tried to make himself breathe. It was just a stray memory, and his fear making him see the image, he told himself. He concentrated on the sword as he finally decided that what he had seen wasn't real, but maybe a manifestation of his heartache over Kalin and his lack of sleep. That's what it had to be. It couldn't have been real. That would be impossible. He would have to be insane to believe it had been real. He opened his eyes. Sister Verna was sitting calmly watching him. She gave a heavy sigh. He thought maybe out of displeasure. Richard swallowed. I'm sorry, nothing happened. Don't be discouraged, Richard. I did not expect anything to happen. It takes a long time to learn to touch the Han. It will happen when it happens. There is no way to rush it. It does no good to push too hard. It comes from finding the inner peace and not by force. That is long enough for today. A few minutes? That's all you want me to try? She lifted an eyebrow. You have had your eyes closed for over an hour. He stared at her and then glanced to the sun... It seemed to have jumped up into the sky. Over an hour. How was that possible? A tingle of apprehension spread through him. She cocked her head. It seemed only a few minutes to you. 
Richard stood. He didn't like the frown on her face. I don't know. I wasn't paying any attention. I guess it did feel like an hour. He started packing the few things he had taken out. The more he thought about what he had seen, the more unreal it seemed. It began to feel like a dream after waking. The fear, the hard edges, the reality fading. He began to feel foolish for being so frightened by a dream. A dream? He hadn't been sleeping. How could he have been dreaming when he was awake? Maybe he hadn't been awake. He had been dead tired. Maybe while he was sitting there concentrating on the sword, he had fallen asleep. That's how he went to sleep sometimes, by concentrating on something until he drifted off. That was the only explanation for the time going so fast. He was asleep, and the rest of it had been a dream. He let out a heavy breath. He felt silly for having been so frightened, but he felt relieved, too. When he turned, Sister Verna was still watching him. Do you wish to shave now? Now that I have shown you I only wish to help you? Richard straightened. I told you, prisoners don't shave. You are not a prisoner, Richard. He stuffed his blanket into his pack, tucking in the corners to make it fit. Will you remove the collar? Her answer was slow in coming, but firm. No, only when it is time. May I leave and go where I wish? She sighed impatiently. No, you must go with me. And if I don't, if I try to leave you? Her eyes narrowed a little. Then I would be forced to prevent it. You would find you did not like that. Richard nodded solemnly. That fits my definition of a prisoner. As long as I'm a prisoner, I will not shave. The horses nickered at his approach, their ears pricking toward him. Sister Verna eyed them suspiciously. He returned the greeting with gentle words and a stiff scratch to the side of each horse's neck. Taking out the brushes, he gave each a quick grooming, paying particular attention to their backs. Sister Verna folded her arms. Why are you doing that? You groomed them last night. Because horses like to roll in the dirt, they could have something under where the saddle goes. Feels kind of like walking around with a rock in your boot, only worse. It could give them a sore, and then we won't be able to ride them. So I like to check them over before I put their saddles on. When he finished, he cleaned the brushes against each other. What are their names? Sister Verna gave a sour frown. They don't have names. They are just horses. We don't give names to dumb animals. He pointed with the curry brush at the chestnut gelding. You don't even give your own a name? He is not my own. They all belong to the Sisters of the Light. I ride whichever one is available. The bay you rode yesterday is the one I rode before you came with me, but it makes no difference. I simply ride whichever one is available. Well, from now on, they're going to have names. Avoids confusion. Yours is the Chestnut, and he will be Jessup. My bay will be Bonnie, and the other bay will be Geraldine. Jessup, Bonnie, and Geraldine, she huffed. No doubt from the adventures of Bonnie Day. Glad to hear you read something other than prophecies, Sister Verna. As I told you before, ones with the gift to come to the palace are brought when they are young. One boy brought the adventures of Bonnie Day with him. I read it to see if it was appropriate for young minds and to see if it was of good moral teachings. I found it to be a preposterous story of three people who would have had no troubles if a one of them had been blessed with brains. Richard smiled a little. Perfect names for dumb animals, then. She scowled at him. It was a book of no intellectual value. No value of any kind. I destroyed it. Richard's smile tried to fade, but he didn't let it. My father, well, the man who raised me as his son, and who I think of as my father, George Cipher, well, he traveled often. One time when he came home, he brought me The Adventures of Bonnie Day as a gift for learning to read. It was the first book I ever had. I read it many times. It brought me pleasure and made me think each time I read it. I, too, thought the three heroes did foolhardy things, and I always vowed not to repeat the same mistakes they made. You may have seen no value in it, but it taught me things, things of value. It made me think. Perhaps, Sister Verna, that is something you don't like your students to do. He turned away from her and started taking apart the bridles. My real father, Dark and Rawl, came to my house just this autumn looking for me. He wanted to cut my belly open and read my entrails, to kill me just as he killed George Cipher. He stole a quick glance over his shoulder. 
Anyway, I wasn't at home, and while he was waiting for me, he tore that book apart and threw the pages all around. Maybe he didn't want me learning any of its lessons or thinking for myself either. Sister Verna didn't say anything, but he could feel her eyes watching him take the bridles apart, undo the headstalls and reins from the bits. After he had them apart, he packed the headstalls away and flipped the reins over his shoulder. He could hear her let out a little angry breath. I'll not be calling horses by names. Richard stacked the three spade bits atop one another on the dirt where the horses had pawed the ground bare. You might want to reconsider the wisdom of that, Sister Verna. She stepped out to the side of him where he could see her, pointing at the ground. What are you doing? Why did you take the bridles apart? What are you doing with those bits? Richard drew the sword. Its distinctive ring filled the cold, bright air. The rage of the magic instantly flooded through him. I'm destroying them, sister. With a scream of fury, and before she could make a move, he brought the sword down with a powerful swing. The tip whistled through the air. The blade shattered the three bits into flying shards of hot metal. She rushed forward, her cloak flapping. What's the matter with you? Have you lost your mind? We need those bits to control the horses. Spade bits can be cruel. I won't allow you to use them. Cruel? They are just stupid beasts. Beasts that need to be controlled. Beasts, he muttered, shaking his head and sliding his sword back into its scabbard. He snugged up the halter on Bonnie and began attaching the reins to the side rings. You don't need a bit to control a horse. I'll teach you how. Besides, without a bit in their mouths, they can eat while we travel. They'll be happier that way. That's dangerous. Spade bits give you control over a headstrong beast. He arched an eyebrow to her. With horses, as with many other things, sister, you often get what you expect to get. Without bits, you don't have any control. Nonsense. If you ride properly, you control with your legs and body. You just have to teach the horse to pay attention and trust you. She stepped close, commanding his attention. That's foolish and dangerous. There are dangers out here. If you get into a dangerous situation and the horse is frightened, it could bolt. Without a spade bit, you won't be able to stop a runaway horse. He halted what he was doing and looked to her intense brown eyes. Sometimes, sister, we get the opposite of what we intend. If we do get in a dangerous situation and you get over anxious and jerk too hard on a spade bit, you could tear the horse's mouth. If you do that, the pain, terror, and anger can be so intense that he won't respond to anything you do. He won't understand. He will only know that you hurt him and that you're hurting him more with each pull on the reins. You'll be the threat. He will throw you in a heartbeat. Then, if he is simply frightened, he will bolt. Worse, he could be angry. Angry horses are dangerous. In trying to avoid danger with a spade bit, you will have brought it upon yourself. He held her startled eyes in his gaze. If we get to a town or something and can find a jointed snaffle bit, I'll let you use that. But I will not allow you to put a spade bit in any horse's mouth as long as I'm with you. She took a deep breath, releasing it carefully as she folded her arms again. Richard, we can't control them without a bit. It's that simple. He gave her a one-sided smile. Sure we can. I'll teach you. The worst thing that can happen without a bit is that he can run away with you. And you'll have a time of stopping him, but sooner or later you will be able to. Your way, you and the horse could be hurt or killed. He turned and scratched Bonnie's neck. First thing you have to do is make friends with them. They have to trust you not to hurt them or let anything happen to them, though you are in charge. If you're their best friend, they won't let anything happen to you. They'll do what you ask. It's surprisingly easy. All you have to do is show them a little respect and kindness along with a firm hand. If they're going to be your friend, they need names to get their attention, and so they know when you're talking to them. He scratched a little harder, the horse leaning into it. Isn't that right, Bonnie? You're a good girl, aren't you? Sure you are. He looked over his shoulder at the sister. Jessup likes it when you scratch under his chin. Give it a try. Show him you want to be friends. He gave her a humorless grin. Like it or not, sister, we don't have the bits anymore. You need to learn a new way. Sister Verna stared at him with a cold look. At last, she unfolded her arms and went over to the chestnut gelding. She stood in front of him a moment and then reached out and stroked the side of his head, finally moving her hand under his jaw to give him a scratch. There's a good boy, 
she said in a flat tone. You may think horses are dumb, Sister Verna, because they don't understand most of your words, but they understand tone of voice. If you want him to believe you, you had better at least pretend you're sincere. She moved her hand up and rubbed his neck. You are a dumb beast, she said in a syrupy sweet voice. Happy, she snapped over her shoulder. As long as you're nice to him. You need to gain his trust. Horses aren't as dumb as you think. Look at the way he's standing. He doesn't trust you. From now on, I'm assigning you to Jessup. You'll tend to all his needs. He must come to depend on you, to trust you. I'll take care of Bonnie and Geraldine. You'll be the only one to groom Jessup, and you will do it after he is ridden, and before he is ridden the next morning. Me? Most certainly not. I'm in charge. You are quite capable of grooming all three, and will do so. This has nothing to do with who's in charge. Among other things, grooming helps build a bond between you and the horse. I already told you the bits are gone. You need to learn a new way. I need to teach you how for your own safety. He handed her a set of rings. Tighten up the halter and attach these to this ring here. While she was doing it, he cut up the leftover melon rind into small pieces. Talk to him. Call him by name and let him know you like him. It doesn't matter what you say. You can describe what you're doing if you want, but make it sound like he's important to you. If you have to, pretend. Treat him like he's one of your little boys. She glared over her shoulder at him, then turned back to hooking up the reins. She started talking softly so Richard couldn't hear her, but he could tell it was gentle. When she finished, he handed her some of the pieces of melon rind. Horses love this. Give him a piece, tell him what a good boy he is. The idea is to change his feelings about having the reins on. Let him know it's going to be pleasant instead of that bit he hates. Pleasant she repeated in a flat tone. Sure, you don't need to show him how much you can hurt him to make him do as you wish. That's counterproductive. Just be firm but gentle. The idea is to try to win him over with kindness and understanding, even if it isn't sincere and not by using force. Richard's smile vanished and he let his features slide into a glare. He leaned closer to her as she stood looking up at him. You should be able to do that, sister. You seem pretty good at it. Just treat him like you treat me. Her stunned expression hardened. I swore on my life to bring you back to the palace of the prophets. When they see you at last, I fear I may be hung for doing my duty. She turned and gave the melon rind to the eager horse, stroking his neck and encouraging him with motherly pats. There's a good fellow, good boy. You like that, Jessup? Good boy. Her voice was heavy with compassion and tenderness. The horse liked it. Richard knew it lacked sincerity. He didn't trust her and wanted her to know it. He didn't appreciate people thinking they were so easily fooling him. He wondered if her attitude toward him would change now that he had let her know he hadn't swallowed her act. Kaylin had told him that Sister Verna was a sorceress. He had no idea what she was capable of, but he had felt the web she had thrown around him in the spirit house. He had seen the fire she started with a thought. She could have easily started the fire the night before without telling him to do it. He had the strong feeling she could break him in half with her Han if she so chose. She was just trying to train him, get him accustomed to doing as she said without thinking, just like training a horse, or a beast as she had called it. He doubted she had any more respect for him than she did for her horses. But instead of using a spade bit to control him, she had the Radha Han around his neck, and that was much worse. But he would have it off when the time came. Even if Kalen didn't want him and had sent him away, he would have it off. While Sister Verna was making friends with Jessup, Richard started saddling the horses. How far to the Palace of the Prophets? It is a long way to the southeast, a long and difficult way. Well, then we will have plenty of time to teach you how to handle Jessup without a bit. You won't have as hard a time as you think. He will defer to and follow Bonnie. Bonnie is the dominant horse. The male is dominant. Richard lifted the saddle up onto Bonnie. A mare is always at the top of the hierarchy. Dams teach and protect the foals. Their influence lasts a lifetime. There isn't a stallion a mare can't intimidate and chase away. Mares can run off any unwanted stallion. A stallion may drive a predator away from the herd, but a mare will chase it and try to kill it. A male horse will always defer to the authority of the lead mare. Bonnie is the lead mare. Jessup and Geraldine will follow her and do as she does, 
so I'll take the lead. Just follow me, and you won't have any trouble. She swung herself up into the saddle. The beam in the central hall, it's the highest. Everyone will be able to see it. What are you talking about? She gave him a solemn look. The beam in the central hall, that is where they will probably hang me from. Richard swung up into his saddle. It's your choice, sister. You don't have to take me there. She sighed. Yes, I do. She gave him her most gentle and concerned look. He thought it quite convincing, if a little strained. Richard, I only wish to help you. I want to be your friend. I think you need a friend right now, very much. Richard bristled. That is a kind offer, Sister Verna, but I decline. You seem a little too quick to put that knife you keep up your sleeve in the back of your friends. Did it bother you at all, Sister Verna, to steal the life from Sister Elizabeth, a friend and companion? It didn't seem so. I decline to offer you my friendship, sister, or my back. If you're sincere in your wish to be my friend, then I would advise you to truly commit to it before I call upon you to prove it. When the time comes, you are only going to get one chance. There are no shades of gray in this matter. Only friends and enemies. Friends don't keep a friend in a collar and hold them prisoner. I intend to have this collar off. When I decide it's time, any friend will help me. Those who try to stop me won't be my friends. They will be dead enemies. Sister Verna shook her head and urged Jessup in behind him as he started away. The beam in the central hall, I'm sure of it. Chapter 20 The sound of her heart pounded in her ears. Struggling to control her panicked breathing, she ducked behind the fat trunk of an old pine, pressing up against the rough bark. If the sisters had discovered she was following them, the dark, damp air filled her lungs in ragged pulls. Her lips moved soundlessly with prayers to the Creator beseeching protection. With eyes as big as gold pieces, she stared into the darkness and swallowed, trying to wet her throat. The dark form glided silently closer. She could just see it as she peeked out past the edge of the tree. She suppressed the urge to scream, to run, and prepared herself to fight. She reached for the sweet light. She embraced her Han. The shadow slipped closer, hesitating, searching. One more step, just one more, and she would spring. She would have to do it right, make sure there was no chance to raise an alarm. It had to be fast, and it would take different kinds of webs all thrown at once. But if she could be precise and quick, there would be no chance of a scream, no alarm, and she would know for sure who it was. She held her breath. The dark shape finally took another step. Spinning out from behind the tree, she threw the webs. Cords of air, strong as dock line, whipped around the form. As the mouth came open, she jammed a solid knot of air into it, gagging it, before it had a chance to cry out. She slumped a little with relief when no sound came forth, but her heart still raced nearly out of control as she gasped for air. With an effort, she managed to bring calm back to her mind, although she maintained a firm grip on her Han, fearful to let her caution slip. There could be others about. She took a deep breath and stepped closer to the immobilized shape. When she was close enough to feel its breath on her face, she extended her palm up and in its center released a thread of fire to light a tiny flame just enough to see the face. Jedediah, she whispered. She pressed her hand to the back of his neck, her fingers feeling the smooth, cool metal of the Radahan and leaned her forehead against his as she closed her eyes. Tears ran down her cheeks. Oh, Jedediah, you gave me such a fright. She opened her eyes and looked up at his terrified face, lit by the tiny flickering flame. I will release you, she whispered softly, but you must be very quiet. Promise? He nodded as best he could, considering how tightly she had him bound. She slipped off the webs, pulling out the gag of air. Jedediah sagged with relief. Sister Margaret, he whispered in a shaky voice. You very nearly made me soil myself. She laughed soundlessly. I'm sorry, Jedediah, but you very nearly did the same to me. She snipped the thin thread of Han fueling the small flame, and they both sank to the ground, leaning against one another, recovering from the fright. Jedediah, several years younger, was bigger than she, a handsome young man. Painfully handsome, she thought. She had been assigned to him when he had first come to the palace, and she had been a novice. 
He had been eager to learn and had studied hard. He had been a pleasure from the first day. She knew others had been difficult, but not Jedediah. He had done everything she had asked of him. She had only to ask, and he threw himself into it. Others thought he was more eager to please her than to please himself in what he did, but none could deny that he was a better student than any other and was becoming a better wizard, and that was all that mattered. This was one area where the results were what counted, not the method, and she had quickly earned her full sisterhood for the way she had brought him along. Jedediah had been more proud of her than she had been of herself when she had been named a Sister of the Light. She was proud of him, too. He was probably the most powerful wizard the palace had seen in a thousand years. Margaret, he whispered, what are you doing out here? Sister Margaret, she corrected. No one is around, he kissed her ear. Stop that, she scolded. The tingle from the kiss ran all the way down her spine. He had added a wisp of magic to the kiss. Sometimes she wished she hadn't taught him that, but other times she ached to have him do it. Jedediah, what are you doing here? You have no business following me, following a sister out of the palace. You're up to something, I know you are. And don't you try to tell me you're not. Something dangerous. At first, I was only a little concerned, but when I realized you were headed out into the Hagen Woods, I became frightened for you. I'm not going to let you go wandering into a dangerous place like this. Not by yourself, anyway. Not without going along to protect you. Protect me, she whispered harshly. Might I remind you of what just happened? You were helpless in a heartbeat. You weren't able to fight off even a single one of my webs. You weren't able to break one of them. You were hardly able to touch your Han, much less use it effectively. You have a lot to learn before you are wizard enough to go around protecting anyone. It's all you can do at this point to keep from stepping on your own feet. The rebuke silenced him. She didn't like to reprimand him so harshly, but this was far too dangerous for him to be involved in, if what she suspected was true. She feared for him and didn't want him hurt. The things she had said weren't entirely true either. He was already more powerful than any sister when he could bring everything together properly, even though that wasn't often. Already there were sisters who were afraid to push him too far. She could feel him look away. I'm sorry, Margaret, he whispered. I was afraid for you. Her heart ached at the hurt in his voice. She kept her head close to his so they could speak in soft whispers. I know you are, Jedediah, and I appreciate your concern. I really do. But this is sister business. Margaret, the Hagen Woods are a dangerous place. There are things in here that could kill you. I don't want you in here. The Hagen Woods were indeed dangerous. They had been for thousands of years and had been left that way by decree of the palace, as if they could do anything about it. It was said the Hagen Woods were a training ground for a very special kind of wizard. That kind of wizard was not sent there, but went in by choice, because he wanted to, craved to, needed to. But that was only what was said. She knew of no wizard going off to spend time in the Hagen Woods, at least not for the last few thousand years. If it was true, any ever did. The tales said that in ancient times there were wizards of that kind, with that much power, and that they went into the Hagen Woods. Few ever came out, it was also said. But there were rules, even to this place. The sun didn't set while I was here. I came after dark. If you don't let the sun set on you in the Hagen Woods, you can leave and I don't intend to stay long enough for the next sun to set on me. It's safe enough, for me anyway. I want you to go home right now. What's so important that you would go in here? What are you doing? I expect an answer, Margaret, a truthful answer. I won't be put off. There is danger for you in this, and I won't be put off. She fingered the finely worked gold flower she kept on a chain around her neck. Jedediah had made it for her himself, not with magic, but with his own hands. It was a morning glory, meant to represent his awakening awareness of the gift, an awareness she had helped to blossom. That little gold flower meant more to her than anything else she had. She took up his hand and leaned against him. All right, Jedediah, I will tell you, but I can't tell you all of it. It's too dangerous for you to know everything. What's too dangerous? What can't you tell me? Be quiet and listen, or I will send you back right now and you know I can do it. His other hand went to the collar. Margaret, you wouldn't do that. 
Tell me you wouldn't do that, not since we have been... Hush! He fell silent. She waited a moment to be certain he was going to stay hushed before she went on. I have suspected for a time that some of the ones with the gift who have gone away or died have not done so as it has been put to us. I think they have been murdered. What? Keep your voice down, she whispered angrily. Do you want to get us killed too? He fell silent once more. I think something awful is going on in the palace of the prophets. I think some of the sisters murdered them. He stared at her in the darkness. Murdered? By sisters? Margaret, you must be crazy to even suggest such a thing. Well, I'm not. But everyone would think I was if I were to say such a thing aloud inside the palace walls. I have to figure out a way to prove it. He thought a moment. Well, I know you better than anyone. And if you say it's true, then I believe you. I'll help. Maybe we could dig up the bodies. Find something to go against what was said about their deaths. Find somebody who saw something. We could carefully question the staff. There are ones I know who... Jedediah, that's not the worst of it. What could be worse? She held the gold flower in the crook of a finger and rubbed her thumb against it. Her voice came even lower than before. There are sisters of the dark in the palace. Even without being able to see him in the darkness, she knew bumps were running up his arms. The night bugs chirped around them as she watched the dark shape of his face. Margaret, sisters of the... That can't be. There is no such thing. That is only a myth, a fable. It is no myth. There are sisters of the dark in the palace. Margaret, please, don't keep saying that. You could be put to death for making an accusation like that. If you accuse a sister of that and can't prove it, you would be put to death. And you can't prove it because it isn't possible. There is no such thing as a sister of the... He couldn't even say the words. The thought of it frightened him so much he couldn't even say it out loud. She knew his fear. She had felt it herself until she had happened on things she could no longer ignore. She wished she hadn't gone to see the prophet that night, or at least not listened to him. The prelate had been angry that Margaret wouldn't give the prophet's message to one of her aides. When she had finally granted an audience, the prelate had only stared blankly at her and asked what the pebble in the pond was. Margaret didn't know. The prelate had lectured her sternly for bothering her with Nathan's nonsense. Margaret had been furious at Nathan when he had denied remembering giving any such message for the prelate. I wish it were as you say, but it is not. They are real. They are among us. They are in the palace. She watched the dark shadow of him a moment. That's why I'm out here, to get the proof. How are you going to do that? They are out here. I followed them. They come out into the Hagen Woods to do something. I'm going to find out what. His head turned about, searching the darkness. Who? Which sisters? Do you know which ones? I know. Some of them, anyway. Which ones are they? Jedediah, I can't tell you. If you knew, and you made even the slightest mistake, you would not be able to defend yourself. If I'm right, and they really are sisters of the dark, they would kill you for knowing. I can't bear the thought of you being hurt. I won't tell you until I go to the prelate's office with the proof. How do you know they are sisters of the... And what proof have you? What proof could you get? She searched the darkness for any sign of danger. One of the sisters has something, a thing of magic, a thing of dark magic. I saw it in her office. It's a little statue. I noticed it one time because she has a number of things, old things everyone thinks are just ancient curiosities. I had seen it before, and like all the rest of the things, it was covered with dust. But this one time, after one of the boys died, I went to her office to talk to her about it, about her report. That little statue was tucked back in a corner with a book leaning against it, hiding it, and it wasn't covered with dust. It was clean. That's it? This sister dusted a statue, and you think... No. No one knows what that statue is. After I saw she had dusted it, I had reason to question what it was. I had to be careful, not let anyone know what I was up to. But I finally found out what it is. How? How did you find out? She remembered her visit to Nathan, and her vow never to reveal how she had learned what that statue was. Never you mind. That is not for you to know. Margaret, how could you? She cut him off. 
I said I'm not telling you. And it isn't important anyway. What is important is what the statue is, not how I found out about it. It's a man holding up a crystal. The crystal is Quillian. What's Quillian? It's an exceedingly rare magic crystal. It has the power to bleed the magic from a wizard. The surprise of that left him speechless for a moment. How do you know it's Quillian if it's so rare? How would you be able to recognize it? Maybe it is just some other crystal that looks similar. That might be true if it hadn't been used. When Quillian is used to bleed the magic from a wizard, it glows orange with the power of his gift, his Han. For just a brief second as I left her office, I saw that statue all clean, hiding behind that book. The Quillian was glowing orange. But that was before I knew what it was. After I found out, I went back to take it to the prelate as proof, but it no longer was glowing. What could that mean? He whispered in a fearful voice. It means that the wizard's power had passed out of the crystal into somebody, a host. Quillian is just a vessel for the gift until it can be placed into someone else. Jedediah, I think the sisters are killing those with the gift and stealing it for themselves. I think they are absorbing the power into themselves. His voice trembled. On top of what they already are? They now have the power of a wizard's gift? She nodded. Yes. That makes them more dangerous than we could even believe, more powerful than we can imagine. That's what scares me the most, not being put to death for making the accusation, but being found out by these sisters. If they really are taking the power into themselves, I don't know how we can stop them. None of us can match them. I need proof so the prelate will believe me. Maybe she will know what to do. I certainly don't. What I can't understand is how the sisters are absorbing the gift from the Quillian. The gift of a wizard, his Han, is male. The sisters are female. A female can't just absorb the male Han. It's not that simple. Otherwise, they would simply have bled the Han into themselves when they killed him. If they are really taking the Han from the males into themselves, I don't know how they're doing it. So what are you doing out here? She folded her arms against an inner chill, even though the air was warm. Do you remember the other day when Sam Weber and Neville Ranson had completed all the tests and were to have their collars off and leave the palace? He nodded in the dark. Yes. I was really disappointed because Sam had promised to come say goodbye and show me he had his Radha Han off. I wanted to wish him well after he was a true wizard. He never came. They told me he left in the night because he didn't want any tearful goodbyes. But Sam was my friend. He was a gentle person, a healer. And it just wasn't like him to leave in that fashion without telling me goodbye. It just wasn't. I was hurt he didn't come by. I really wanted to wish him well. They killed him. What? He sagged down a little. Oh, dear creator, no. His voice broke with tears. Are you sure? How do you know? She put a comforting hand on his shoulder. The day after he supposedly left in such a strange manner, I suspected something terrible had happened. I went to see if the Quillian was glowing again, but the door was shielded. That doesn't prove anything. Sisters shield their rooms or offices sometimes. You do it yourself when you don't want to be disturbed, like when we are together. I know, but I wanted to see the Quillian, so I waited around a corner until the sister came to her office. I came out from where I waited, timing it so that as I walked past, she would be entering. As I went by, and just before she closed the door behind herself, I saw into her dark office. I saw the statue on the shelf behind the book. It was glowing orange. I'm sorry, Jedediah. His voice lowered with anger. Who was it? Which sister? I'm not going to tell you, Jedediah. Not until I can take proof to the prelate. It's too dangerous. He thought a moment. If this crystal really is Quillian, and it would prove what she is, why wouldn't she hide it better? Maybe because she didn't think there was a chance of anyone knowing what it was. Maybe because she isn't afraid and doesn't take the time to be any more careful than she thinks necessary. Then let's go back, break the shield, get the cursed thing, and take it to the prelate. I can break the shield, I know I can. I was going to do that myself. I went back to do it tonight, but the room wasn't shielded anymore. I snuck in to take the statue, but it was gone. That was when I saw her leaving the palace, and I saw others leaving too. I followed them out here. 
If I can steal the Quillian while it's glowing, I can prove they are sisters of the dark. I have to stop them before they can suck the life out of anyone else. Jedediah, they're murdering people, but worse, I fear the reason they are doing it. He let out a soft sigh. All right, but I'm going with you. She gritted her teeth. No, you are going back. Margaret, I love you. And if you send me back to worry all alone, I will never forgive you. I'll go to the prelate myself and make the accusation to bring you help. Though I may be put to death for making the accusation, I know it would raise suspicions and maybe an alarm. That's the only other way I'll be able to protect you. Either I go with you or I go to the prelate. I promise you I will. She knew he was telling the truth. Jedediah always kept his promises. Powerful wizards always did. Rising to her knees, she leaned over and put her arms around his neck. I love you too, Jedediah. She kissed him deeply as he rose up on his knees to meet her. His hands went under the back of her dress, and he gripped her bottom, pulling her against him. The feeling of his hands on her flesh made her moan softly. His hot lips kissed her neck and then her ear, sending shimmers of magic tingling through her. His knee forced her legs apart, giving his hands access to her. She gasped at the contact. Come away with me now, he whispered in her ear. Let's go back, and you can shield your room, and I'll give you more until you scream. You can scream all you want, and no one will hear you. She pushed away from him and pulled his hands out from under her dress. He was breaking down her resistance. She found she had to force herself to stop him. He was using his magic to seduce her away from the danger, trying to save her by drawing her away. She knew that if she let it go on for another second, it would work. Jedediah, she panted in a hoarse whisper. Please, don't make me have to use the collar to stop you. This is too important. Lives are at stake. He tried to reach out to her once more, but she sent a cord of power through her hands on his wrists to stop him. She firmly held his hands away. I know, Margaret. Your life is one of them. I don't want anything to harm you. I love you more than anything in the world. Jedediah, this is more important than my life. This is about the lives of everyone. I think this is about the nameless one. He froze stiff. You can't be serious. Why do you think these sisters want this power? What do they need with it? Why would they be willing to kill for it? To what end? Who do you think sisters of the dark serve? Dear Creator, he whispered slowly, don't let her be right. His hands came up and held her by her shoulders. Margaret, who else knows these things? Who have you told? Only you, Jedediah. I know who four, maybe five of the Sisters of the Dark are, but there are others, and I don't know who they are. I don't know who I can trust. There were eleven I followed out here tonight, but there could easily be more. What about the prelate? Maybe you shouldn't go to her. She could be with them. She shook her head with a sigh. You may be right, but it's the only chance we have. There is no one else I can think of who can help me. I have to go to her. She touched her fingertips to his face. Jedediah, please go back. If anything were to happen to me, then you would be able to do something. There would be someone who knew. No, I won't leave you. If you make me go back, I will tell the prelate. I love you. I would rather die than live without you. But there are others to think of, other lives at stake. I don't care about anyone else. Please, Margaret, don't ask me to leave you to this danger. Sometimes you can be infuriating, my love. She took his hands up in hers. Jedediah, if we are caught, if we are together, then I accept the risk. She twined her fingers through his. Then be my husband, as we have talked about. If I die tonight, I want it to be as your wife. He put a hand behind her head and drew her against him. Pulling her hair away from her ear, he whispered softly into it. That would make me the happiest man in the world. I love you so much, Margaret. But how can we be married here, now? We can say the words. Our love is all that counts. Not some other person saying words for us. Words coming from our hearts will bond us better than anyone else could do. He squeezed her tight. This is the happiest moment in my life. He pulled back, taking up her hands again. In the darkness, they looked at each other. I, Jedediah, pledge to be your husband in life and in death. I offer you my life, my love, my eternal devotion. 
May we be bonded in the Creator's eyes and heart and in our own. She whispered the words back to him as tears streamed down her cheeks. She had never been so afraid and so happy in all her life. She shook with the need of him. When they finished the words, they kissed. It was the most tender, loving kiss he had ever given her. Tears continued to run down her face as she pressed against him, against his lips. Her hands clutched the back of his broad shoulders, holding him to her. His arms around her made her feel safer and more loved than she had ever felt. At last they parted. She struggled to catch her breath. I love you, my husband. I love you, my wife. Always and forever. She smiled. Even though she couldn't see it in the dark, she knew he was smiling too. Let's go see if we can get some proof. Let's see if we can put a stop to the Sisters of the Dark. Let's make the Creator proud of the Sisters of the Light and a wizard-to-be. He squeezed her hand. Promise me you won't do anything foolish. Promise me you won't try to do anything that might get you killed. I want to spend some time with you in bed, not the woods. I need to see what they are up to, see if I can find a way to prove all this to the prelate. But they are more powerful than I am, to say nothing of the fact that there are at least eleven of them. On top of that, if they truly are sisters of the dark, they have the use of subtractive magic. We have no defense against that. I don't know how we are to get the Quillian away from them. Maybe we will see something else that will help us. If we just keep our eyes open and let the Creator guide us, maybe He will reveal what it is we can do. But I don't want either of us taking any more of a chance than we have to. We must not be discovered. He nodded. Good. That's the way I want it to. But Jedediah, I'm a sister of the light. That means I have responsibilities. Responsibilities to the Creator and all his children. Though we are now husband and wife, it's still my job to guide you. In this we are not equals. I'm in charge. And I will only allow you to go with me if you promise to abide by that. You are not yet a full wizard. If I tell you something, you must obey. I'm still better with my Han than you are with yours. I know, Margaret. One reason I wanted to be your husband is because I respect you. I wouldn't want a weak wife. You have always guided me, and that will not change now. You've given me everything I have. I will follow you always. With a smile, she shook her head. You are a marvel, my husband, a marvel of the best kind. You will make a remarkable wizard, truly remarkable. I've never told you, because I always feared you would let the knowledge swell your head, but some of the sisters say that they think you may prove to be the most powerful wizard in a thousand years. He didn't speak, and she couldn't see his face, but she was sure he was blushing. Margaret, your eyes are the only ones I need to see filled with pride. She kissed his cheek and then took his hand. Let's go see how we can put a stop to this. How do you know where they went? How can we follow them? It's as dark as pitch in these woods. The trees hide the moon. She pinched his cheek. A trick my mother taught me. I've never shown it to anyone. When I saw them leaving the palace, I cast a pool of my Han at their feet. They stepped through it. It leaves tracks of my own Han. Only I can see them. Their footprints are as bright as the sun on a pond to me, but to no other. You must teach me this trick. Someday, I promise. Come on. She led him by the hand as she followed the glow of the sisters' footprints through the dense woods. Distant night birds came in haunting voices. Owls hooted, and other creatures made low screams and clicks. The ground was uneven, tangled with roots and brush, but the glowing footprints helped her to see the way. The damp heat made her sweat, causing her dress to cling to her wet skin. When she got home, she would shield her room and she would have a bath. A long bath with Jedediah. Then she would let him use his magic on her, and she would use hers on him. They went deeper into the Hagen woods, deeper than she had ever gone before. Vapor drifting from boggy areas carried the pervasive stench of rotting vegetation. They passed through dark gullies veiled with hanging roots and moss that brushed against her face and arms, making her flinch at the unexpected contact. The footprints led up and over sparsely wooded rocky ridges, at the top of one, standing in the still, damp air, she looked back out across the somber landscape. In the far distance, she could see the flickering lights of Tanimura, and set among the lights, rising up in the silvery moonlight, the Palace of the Prophets, its dark shape blocking out the lights of the city beyond. She longed to be back there, to be home, but this was something that had to be done. There was no one else to do it, 
The lives of everyone depended on her. The Creator was depending on her. Still, she longed to be home and safe. But home was no longer safe. It was as dangerous as the Hagen Woods, if there really were Sisters of the Dark. Even with as much as she knew, it was difficult for her to accept the idea. The prelate had to believe her. She just had to. There was no one else she could turn to for help. She wished there were even just one sister she could trust, confide in, but she didn't dare trust anyone. Nathan had warned her not to trust anyone. Even though she wished Jedediah were home and safe, she was glad to have him with her. She knew there was nothing he could do to help, but it still felt good to have him to confide in. Her husband. She smiled at the thought. She would never forgive herself if anything happened to him. She would protect him with her life if she had to. The ground pitched into a descent. Through gaps in the trees, she could see they were going down into a deep bowl in the earth. The edge was steep, and they had to move slowly so as not to send any rocks tumbling through the woods. One started to slide as her foot touched it, and she quickly used a handful of air to stop it, and then push it firmly into the ground. She sighed in relief. Jedediah followed her, a silent, comforting shadow. Her tension relaxed a little when they passed from the loose rock back into denser woods where the ground was mossy and silent to step on. The faint sound of chanting drifted to them through the thick woods, carried on heavy, fetid air. Low, rhythmic, guttural tones of words she couldn't understand resonated in her chest. Even without understanding the words, she felt revulsion at them, as if they made the air reek. Jedediah gripped her upper arm, dragging her to a halt. He put his mouth close to her ear. Margaret, please, he whispered. Let's go back now, before it's too late. I'm afraid. Jedediah, she growled as she reached up and snatched him by the collar. This is important. I'm a sister of the light. You're a wizard. What do you think I've been training you for? To stand on a street down in the market and perform tricks? To have people throw coins at you? We serve the Creator. He has given us everything we have so we may use it to help others. Others are in danger. We must help. You're a wizard. Act like one. She could see his wide eyes in the faint light. He sagged slightly as the tension went out of his muscles. I'm sorry. You're right. Forgive me. I will do what I must. I promise. Her anger cooled. I'm afraid too. Touch your Han. Keep a firm grip on it, but not too tight. Hold it so you can release it in an instant as I've taught you. If anything happens, don't hold back. Don't be afraid of how much you might hurt them. If you do need your power, anything less than all of it will not be enough. If you keep your head, you're strong enough to defend yourself. You can do it, Jedediah. Have faith in what I've taught you, what all the sisters have taught you. Have faith in the Creator, in what He has given you. You have it for a reason. We all do. This may be the reason. Tonight may be what you've been called for. He nodded again, and she turned back to the glowing footprints, following them into the thick forest. They wandered through the trees toward the center of the bowl, toward where the chanting was coming from. The closer they got, the more the voices made her skin prickle. The voices were sisters. She thought she recognized some of them. Dear Creator, she prayed, give me the strength to do what I must to help you. Give Jedediah strength too. Help us serve you to help others. Little flickers of light came through the leaves. They crept closer. The trees around her were huge. The two of them glided from one trunk to another, no longer following the footprints. They could see glimpses now of something through openings in the underbrush. Slowly they tiptoed forward across the open forest floor, beneath large spreading spruce trees. The needles were soft and quiet to walk on. Shoulder to shoulder they slid behind low, heavy brush at the edge of woods. It was as close as they could go. Beyond lay a flat, round, open area. At least a hundred candles were set on the ground in a ring like a fence or boundary, as if holding back the dark forest. Inside the candles was a circle drawn on the ground. It looked to be made of white sand that sparkled with little points of prismatic light. It looked like the descriptions of sorcerer's sand she had heard, although she had never actually seen any. It stood out clearly in the candlelight and the light of the moon overhead. Symbols were drawn with the same white sand, they were inside the circle, points of them touching the outer boundary of the circle at irregular intervals. Margaret had never seen the symbols before, but she knew some of the elements of them from an old book. They spoke to the underworld. 
About halfway in from the outer white line and candles, eleven sisters sat in a circle. Margaret stared harder, trying to see in the dim, flickering light. It looked as if each had a hood over her head with holes cut for the eyes. They chanted in unison. Shadows from the sisters extended inward to a point in the center. In the center lay a woman, naked, except for a hood like the others. She lay on her back, her hands crossed over her breasts, her legs pressed together. Twelve. With the one in the center, that made twelve. She searched the circle of sisters again. Even with the candles, it was still dark, and the candles were to the sisters' backs. Her eyes stopped on a form on the opposite side of the circle. Her breath caught in her throat. That form was larger than the rest. It was hunched, its head lowered, and without a hood. It sat at a convergence of lines in the symbols. It was not a sister. With a start, she saw the faint orange glow. The statue with the quillion was resting in its lap. She and Jedediah crouched frozen, watching the circle of sisters as they chanted. After a time, one of them to the side of the hunched form stood. The chanting stopped. She spoke short, sharp words in a language Margaret didn't know. At points in the speech, her hand shot into the air, flinging sparkling dust over the naked woman in the center. The dust ignited, bathing the hooded sisters with brief, harsh light. At the flash, they all answered with odd, rhyming words. She and Jedediah exchanged looks, her own confused, frightened feelings reflected in his eyes. The standing sister flung both hands up, calling out a list of strange words. She went to the naked woman, stood at her head, and threw up her arms again. The sparkling dust caught fire once more. This time the orange glow from the quillion brightened. The head of the hunched form slowly rose. Margaret made a silent gasp when she saw the face of the beast. Its fanged mouth opened with a low growl. The sister drew a delicately wrought silver scepter from her cloak and gave it sharp shakes as she chanted again, sprinkling water over the prone woman. Something was happening to the quillion. It brightened and then dimmed. The dark eyes of the beast watched the naked woman. Margaret stared wide-eyed. Her heart pounded so hard it felt as if it would tear a hole in her chest. As the quillion faded, the beast's eyes began to glow orange, the same color orange as the quillion. As the quillion dimmed, the glow in the beast's eyes intensified until the little statue was dark and the thing's eyes shined bright. Two more sisters stood. They moved to each side of the first. The first knelt, her hooded head lowered, looking down to the naked woman. It is time. If you are sure, you know what must be done, the same as has been done to us. You are the last to be offered the gift. Do you wish to accept it? Yes, I'm entitled. It's mine. I want it. Margaret thought she knew both voices, but she wasn't sure because the hoods muffled their words. Then it shall be yours, sister. The other two knelt beside her as she pulled a cloth from her cloak, twisting it between her fists. You must pass this test of pain to gain the gift. We cannot touch you with our magic while it is being done, but we will help you as best we can. I will do anything. It's mine. Let it be done. The naked woman spread her arms. The sisters to each side leaned with all their weight on her wrists. The sister at her head held the twisted cloth over the hooded face. Open your mouth and bite down on this. She put the cloth between the woman's teeth. Now, open your legs. You must keep them open. If you try to close them, it will be a rejection of what you are being offered and you will lose the chance forever. The naked woman stared fixedly up at nothing. She panted with fear, her breast heaving. Slowly, she spread her legs. The beast stirred, giving a low grunt. Margaret gripped Jedediah's forearm, her fingers digging into him. The beast sniffed the air. As it slowly unfolded itself, Margaret saw that it was larger than it had looked when it was all hunched over. It was powerfully built, looking mostly like a man. Flickers of candlelight reflected off sweat-slicked, knotted muscles of its arms and chest. Downy hair started at the narrow hips, growing coarser farther down the legs to the ankles, where it was the longest, thickest. But the head was something other than a man. It was a horror of anger and fangs. A long, thin tongue flicked out, tasting the air. The eyes glowed orange in the dim light, orange with the power of the gift it had absorbed from the quillion. 
As it stretched out on its hands and knees toward the naked woman, Margaret almost gasped aloud. She recognized the beast. She had seen a drawing of it in an old book, the same book in which she had seen drawings of some parts of the spells before her. She wanted to scream. It was a namble, one of the nameless one's minions. Oh, dear creator, she prayed fervently, please protect us. Growling in a low rumble, its powerful muscles flexing, its haunted eyes glowing orange, the namble edged like a huge cat toward the woman on the ground. Head low, it crawled between her legs. In a state of ragged fear, the woman still stared up at nothing. The namble sniffed at her crotch. Its long tongue flicked out, running over her. She flinched, making a small jerk of a sound against the cloth in her teeth. But she kept her legs open. Her eyes did not move. She did not look at the namble. The sisters in the circle began a soft chant. The namble licked her again, slower, grunting this time as it did so. She squealed against the rag. Beads of sweat shimmered on her flesh. She kept her legs wide apart. Rising up on its knees, the beast gave a throaty roar to the black sky. Its pointed, barbed, erect phallus stood out, plainly silhouetted against the candles beyond. Muscles bulged in knotted cords along its arms and shoulders as the namble bent forward, putting a fist to each side of the woman. Its tongue licked out around her throat as it gave a vibrating rumble of a growl, and then it lowered itself, covering her with its massive form. Its hips hunched forward. The woman's eyes winced shut as she screamed against the cloth in her teeth. The namble gave a quick, powerful thrust, and her eyes snapped open in a panic of pain. Even with the cloth clenched in her teeth, her screams could be heard over the chanting each time the beast knocked the wind from her, adding more force to the shrieks. Margaret had to force herself to take a breath as she watched. She hated these women. They had given themselves over to something unspeakably evil. Still, they were her sisters, and she could hardly bear to watch one being hurt. She realized she was shaking. She clenched the gold flower at her neck in one fist and Jedediah's arm with her other as tears streamed down her face. The beast thrashed at the sister on the ground as the three sisters held her. Her muffled screams of torment ripped at Margaret's heart. The sister holding the cloth finally spoke. If you want the gift, you must encourage him to give it to you. He will not surrender it unless you overcome his control. Unless you take it from him, you must win it from him. Do you understand? Crying, her eyes shut tight, the woman nodded. The sister pulled the cloth away. Then he is yours now. Take the gift, if you will. The other two released her arms, and the three of them returned to their places in the circle, taking up the chanting with the others. The woman let out a wail that turned Margaret's blood to ice. It made her ears hurt. The woman flung her arms and legs around the namble, clutching herself to it, moving with it, moving with the chanting. Her screams died away as she panted with the effort. Margaret could watch no longer. She closed her eyes and swallowed back a wail of her own that tried to force itself from her throat. But even with her eyes closed, it was no better. She could still hear it. Please, dear creator, she begged in her mind. Let it end. Please let it end. And then, with a husky grunt, it did. Margaret opened her eyes to see the namble still, its back hunched. It shuddered and then slowly went limp. The woman struggled to breathe under its weight. With strength that seemed impossible, she at last pushed the namble off her. Chest heaving, it rolled to its hands and knees and slunk back to its place in the circle, folding itself into a dark bundle. The chanting had stopped. The woman lay on the ground for a time, panting, recovering. She was covered with a glistening sheen of sweat that reflected the yellow light of the candle flames. Taking one last deep breath, the woman came smoothly to her feet. A dark stain of blood ran down her legs. With a calm awareness that sent a chill up Margaret's spine and caught her breath short, the woman turned to face her, pulling off her hood. The menacing orange glow in her eyes faded, and they returned to the pale blue with dark violet flecks that Margaret knew so well. Sister Margaret, her tone was as mocking as the smile on her thin lips. Did you enjoy watching? I thought you might. Wide-eyed, Margaret rose slowly to her feet. Across the circle, the sister who had held the cloth also rose and pulled off her hood. Margaret, dear, how nice of you to show such interest in our little group. I didn't know you were that stupid. Did you think I let you see the quillion in my office by accident? That I wasn't aware someone was interested? 
I had to know who was skulking about, looking into things that were none of their concern. I let you see it. I wasn't sure, though, until you followed us. Her smile froze Margaret's breathing. Think we are fools? I saw the pool of Han you cast for us to step in. I obliged you. Such a shame for you. Margaret's hand was clutched tightly around the gold flower at her neck, her fingernails digging into her palm. How could they have seen the pool of her Han? She had underestimated them, that was how. Underestimated what they could do with the gift. It was going to cost her her life. But only her, only her. Please, dear creator, only her. She could sense Jedediah close at her side. Jedediah, she whispered, run. I'll try to hold them off while you escape. Run, my love. Run for your life. His powerful hand came up and gripped her upper arm. I don't think so, my love. Her eyes were captured by his cruelly empty expression. I tried to save you, Margaret. I tried to get you to turn back, but you wouldn't listen. He glanced at the sister across the clearing. If I got her oath, couldn't we just... The sister glared back. He sighed. No, I suppose we couldn't. He gave her a strong shove into the clearing. She came to a stumbling stop at the edge of the candles. She had gone numb. Her mind refused to work. Her voice refused to work. The sister across the circle clasped her hands together, looking to Jedediah. Has she told anyone else? No, just me. She was looking for proof before she went to anyone else for help. His eyes returned to her. Isn't that right, my love? He shook his head again, the smirk of a smile touching his lips. Lips she had kissed. She felt sick. She felt like the biggest fool the Creator had ever seen. Such a shame. You have done well, Jedediah. You will be rewarded. And as for you, Margaret, well, tomorrow Jedediah will report that after trying to avoid the insistent affections of an older woman, he finally and firmly rejected you for good and you ran away in shame and humiliation. If they come here and find your bones, it will confirm their fears that you chose to end your life because you felt unworthy to live any longer as a sister of the light. The dark-flecked eyes glided back to Margaret. Let me have her. Let me test my new gift. Let me taste it. Those eyes kept Margaret frozen, her hand still clutching the gold flower at her neck. She could hardly breathe through the numbing agony of knowing Jedediah had betrayed her. She had prayed to the Creator to give Jedediah strength, strength to help others. She had had no idea who those others would be. The Creator had answered her prayers, foolish as they had been. When the sister consented, the thin lips widened in a greedy grin. Margaret felt naked, helpless in the penetrating gaze of those flecked eyes. At last, Margaret made her mind work. Her thoughts sprang to a terrified groping for a way of escape. She could only think of one thing to do before it was too late. With panicked abandon, she let her Han explode through every fiber of herself and brought forth a shield, the most powerful shield she knew, a shield of air. She made it hard as steel, impenetrable. She poured her hurt and hate into it. The thin smile never left. The flecked eyes didn't move. Air, is it then? With the gift, I can see it now. Shall I show you what I can do with air? What the gift can do with it? The Creator's power will protect me, Margaret managed. The thin smile turned to a sneer. You think so? Let me show you the Creator's impotence. Her hand came up. Margaret expected a ball of wizard's fire. It wasn't. It was a ball of air so dense she could see it, see it coming. It was so dense it distorted what was seen through it. Margaret could hear the whoosh of its approach, the wail of its power. It went through her shield like flaming pitch through paper. It shouldn't have been able to do that. Her shield was air. Air should not have been able to break a shield of air, not a shield as strong as she had made. But this was air made not by a mere sister, but one with the gift, a wizard's gift. Confused, Margaret realized she was lying on the ground, looking up at the stars, pretty stars, the Creator's stars. She couldn't draw a breath, simply couldn't. She thought it odd. She didn't remember the air hitting her, only her breath being ripped violently from her lungs. She felt cold, but there was something warm against her face, warm and wet. It was a comfort. Her legs didn't seem to work. Try as she might, she couldn't make them move. 
With the greatest of effort, she managed to lift her head a bit. The sisters hadn't moved, but now somehow they were farther away. They all watched her. Margaret looked down at herself. Something was terribly wrong. Below her ribs, there was mostly nothing there. Just the shredded, wet remains of her insides, and then nothing. Where the rest of her should have been, there was nothing. Where had her legs gone? They must be somewhere. They had to be somewhere. There they were. They lay a little distance away where she had been standing. So that was why she couldn't take a breath. Air shouldn't have been able to do that. It was impossible. At least air wielded by a sister shouldn't have been able to do that. It was a wonder. Dear Creator, why have you not helped me? I was doing your work. Why have you let this be done? It should hurt, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it hurt to be ripped in half? But it didn't. It didn't hurt the least little bit. Cold. She felt only cold. But the warm rope of her guts lying against her face felt good. Warm. She took comfort in the warmth. Maybe it didn't hurt because the Creator was helping her. That must be it. The Creator had taken her pain. Dear Creator, thank you. I did my best. I am sorry I failed you. Send another. Boots were near. Jedediah. Husband Jedediah. Monster Jedediah. I tried to warn you, Margaret. I tried to keep you away. You can't say I didn't try. Her arms lay sprawled out to her sides. In her right hand, she could feel the little gold flower. She hadn't let go of it. Even as she was torn in half, she never let go. She tried to now, but she couldn't make her hand open. She wished she had the strength to open her hand. She didn't want to die with that in her hand. But she just couldn't open her fingers. Dear Creator, I have failed in this too. Since she couldn't release it, she did the only other thing she could think of. She sent the rest of her power into it. Maybe someone would see and ask the right question. Tired. She was so very tired. She tried to close her eyes, but they wouldn't close. How could a person die if they couldn't close their eyes? There were a lot of stars, pretty stars. There seemed to be fewer than she remembered, hardly any at all. She thought her mother had told her once how many there were, but she couldn't remember. Well, she would just have to count them. One... Two. Chapter 21 How long? Chase asked. The seven fierce-looking men that were squatted down in a half-circle before her and Chase just stared at him and blinked. None of the seven had any weapons except belt knives, and one didn't even have that. But there were a lot of other men standing behind them, and they all had bows or spears or both. Rachel tugged her thick brown woolen cloak tighter around herself, and shifted her weight as she squatted, wiggling her toes, wishing her feet weren't so cold. They were starting to tingle. She stroked her fingers over the big amber stone hanging on the chain from her neck. Its smooth, teardrop shape felt warm against her fingers. Chase mumbled something Rachel couldn't understand as he pushed his heavy black cloak back over his shoulders and then pointed with a stick at the two people drawn in the dirt. All the leather belts for his weapons creaked, as he leaned forward on boots big enough for any of the other men to fit both of their feet into just one. He tapped his stick on the ground again, then turned and pushed his hand out toward the grassland. How long? He pointed at the drawing and pushed his hand out a few more times. How long since they left? They chattered something Chase and she couldn't understand, and then the man with long silver hair falling down around his sun-brown face, the one who didn't have a coyote hide around his shoulders, but wore only simple buckskin clothes, drew another picture in the dirt. She could tell what it was easy this time. It was the sun. He made marks under it. Chase watched as the man drew three rows of marks under the picture of the sun. He stopped. Chase stared at the picture. Three weeks. He looked up at the man with the long hair. Three weeks? He pointed at the sun on the ground and held up most of his fingers three times. They've been gone three weeks. The man nodded and made some more of those funny words. Sidden handed her another piece of flatbread with honey. It tasted wonderful. She tried to eat it slowly, but it was gone before she knew it. She had tasted honey only once before, back at the castle when she lived there as the princess's playmate. The princess never let her have honey, said it wasn't for the likes of her, but one of the cooks had given her some once. 
her stomach fluttered at the memory of how mean the princess had been to her. She never wanted to live in a castle again. Now that she was Chase's daughter, she would never have to. Every night she lay in her blankets before she went to sleep and wondered what the rest of her new family was like. Chase said she would have sisters and brothers and a real mother. He said she would have to mind her new mother. She could do that. It was easy to mind when someone loved you. Chase loved her. He never really said it, but it was easy to tell. He put his huge arm around her and stroked her hair when she was afraid of sounds in the dark. Page 239. Sidden smiled at her as he licked the honey off his fingers. It was nice to see him again. When they had first come here, she thought there was going to be trouble. Scary men, all painted with mud and with grass stuck all over themselves, came up to them when they were still out on the grassland. She didn't even see where they came from. They were just there all of a sudden. Rachel was afraid at first, because the men pointed arrows at them, and their voices sounded scary, and she couldn't understand what they said. But Chase just got off the horse and held her in his arms while he watched them. He didn't even draw his sword or anything. She didn't think anything scared him. He was the bravest man she ever saw. The men had looked at her as she stared at them, and Chase stroked her hair and told her not to be afraid. The men stopped, pointing the arrows at them, and led them to the village. When they got here, she saw Sidden. Sidden knew her and Chase from before, when Kalen had saved him from Queen Melena back in the castle. Zed, Kalen, Chase, Sidden, and she had all been together when they were running with the box. She couldn't speak Sidden's language, but he knew them and told his father who they were. After that, everyone was real nice to them. Chase pointed with one finger to one of the pictures of a person, the finger of his other hand to the other picture, and then held the fingers together and pointed away, moving his hands like they were going over hills. Richard and Kalen left three weeks ago, and they went north to Aden Drill. The men all shook their heads and started jabbering again. Sidden's father held up his hand for quiet. He pointed at himself and the other men and held up three fingers. Then he pointed at the picture on the ground that had a dress and said Kalen's name, and then he pointed north. Chase pointed at the picture of the sun, then the picture of Kalen, then at the men, holding up three fingers, then north. Three weeks ago, Kalen and three of your men went north to Aidendril. The men all nodded and said, Kalen, Aidendril. Chase put a knee to the ground as he leaned forward, tapping the picture of the other person. But Richard went too, he pointed north again. Richard went to Aidendril too, with Kalen. The men all turned to the man with the long silver hair. He looked at Chase and then shook his head. The carved piece of bone hanging from a leather thong around his neck swung back and forth. He pointed down at the picture of the man with a sword and then pointed in a different direction. Chase stared at the man for a long minute, then he frowned, as if he didn't understand. The man leaned over with the stick and drew three more people, each with a dress. He looked up from under his eyebrows as if he wanted to make sure Chase was watching, and then he drew an X across two of the figures. His eyes returned to Chase again as he folded his arms over his knees, waiting. What does that mean? Dead? Is that what you mean? They are dead? The men stared, not moving. Chase pulled a single finger like a knife across his throat. Dead? The man with the silver hair gave one nod and said, Dead but it sounded a little funny, the way he made the word seem longer than it should. He pointed with his stick to the picture of the sun, then the picture of Kalen, and then he pointed over his shoulder to the way they went. He pointed to the sun again, then at the picture of Richard, then at the picture of the woman without the X, then he pointed in a different direction. Chase stood. His chest rose and then fell as he let out the deep breath. He was awfully tall. He stared in the direction the man with the silver hair said Richard had gone. East, that's deeper into the wilds, he whispered to himself. Why isn't he with Kalen? He rubbed his chin. Rachel thought he looked worried. It couldn't be that he looked scared. Nothing scared Chase. Dear spirits, why would Richard go deeper into the wilds? What could possess Kalen to let that boy go into the wilds? And who is he with? The men all glanced at each other, as if they were wondering why Chase was talking to the air. Chase squatted back down, all his leather creaking, and pointed at the drawing of the third woman and frowned and shrugged at the men. He pointed at the picture of Richard and the woman and pointed east again. 
He held the palms of his hands up near his shoulders as he shrugged and made faces to show he didn't understand. The man with the long silver hair gave Chase a sad look as he let out a long breath. He pointed at the third woman, the one without an X, and then he turned and took a rope from a man behind him. He wrapped the rope around his own neck. He looked to Chase's frown, and then he pointed to the picture of Richard. When Chase looked up and their eyes met, the man pulled the rope tight with a snap. He pointed east. He touched the stick to the picture of Kalen, and then pulled his fingers down his cheeks from the corners of his eye, like tears, then pointed north. Chase stood. It was almost a jump. His face was pale. She took him, he whispered. This woman captured Richard and took him into the wilds. Rachel stood next to him. What does it mean, Chase? Why didn't Kalen go with him? He looked down at her. His face had an odd, still look that made her stomach knot up. She went for help. She went to Aiden Drill to get Zed. No one made a sound. He stared back out to the east as he hooked a thumb behind his big silver belt buckle. Dear spirits, he whispered to himself, if Richard really did go into the wilds, turn him north. Don't let him go to the south, or even Zed won't be able to help him. Rachel hugged her doll tight. What's the wilds? A very bad place, little one. He stared out unblinking toward the darkening sky. A very bad place. The way he said it all calm and quiet gave her goosebumps. Zed could feel the muscles in the horse's back flexing under him as he ducked beneath a branch while slowing the animal. Zed favored riding bareback. If he needed to ride a horse, he preferred to let the animal feel as unencumbered as possible. He thought it only fair. Most seemed to appreciate his consideration, this one especially. She gave him more than she ever would have under a saddle, and he had taken everything she had given. He had proffered his saddle and the rest of the tack to a man named Half. Half had the biggest ears Zed had ever seen. How a man with ears the like of those had ever found a wife was a wonder. But have a wife he did, and four children, too, and he looked to have more need of the tack than Zed. Not to ride, of course, but to sell. His crops and stores had been carried off by soldiers of the Daharan army. It was the least Zed could do. After all, Rachel was soaked to the bone, and half offered them a dry place to sleep, even if it was in a dilapidated little barn, and his wife offered them a cabbage soup, thin as it was, asking nothing in return. It was worth a saddle just to see the look on Chase's face, when Zed said he wasn't hungry. The big man ate enough for three men, though, and he should have known better. There was going to be much hunger this winter. The tack wouldn't bring its worth, not with hunger spreading like a dark wind before a thunderhead, but it would bring something, maybe enough to take the hardest edge off the winter. Zed saw Chase put a coin in each of the four children's pockets when he thought no one was looking, growling at them in a tone that would make a grown man blanch, but which, for some odd reason, made children only smile, not to look in the pocket until he was gone. He hoped it wasn't gold. The boundary warden could smell a thief open a window in the next town and probably tell you his name, too, but he had no wits about him around children. Half suspiciously wanted to know what he was to do in return for the tack. Zed told him he was to swear his undying loyalty to the mother confessor and the new Lord Raoul of Dahara, both of whom had put a stop to things the like of which had been done to him. The man had stared at him, his big ears sticking out under that ridiculous knit hat with a tassel on each side that only served to draw attention where it wasn't needed, and had said, Done, with a firm nod. A small start, one loyal for the price of a saddle, that it would all be so easy. But that was weeks ago. Now he was alone. The sweet smell of a birch fire drifted to him through the thick woods, the horse lifting her nose to it as she stepped carefully along the narrow path. In the still air, gathering darkness sent deepening shadows across the way. Even before the small house came into view, he could hear the racket, the sound of furniture being overturned, the crash of pots and pans and demons being cursed. The horse's ears pricked toward the commotion as they rode down the twisting trail. Zed gave her a reassuring pat on the neck. The little house, wood walls dark with age and a roof thickly layered with ferns and dry pine needles, was set back into the towering trees, nestled among rough trunks dark in the day's end. He dismounted to the side of the brown dead ferns, spreading like a garden in front of the house. The horse rolled her eyes toward him as he came around to give her a scratch under her jaw. 
Be a good girl and find yourself something to eat. He put a finger under the horse's chin, forcing her head up. But stay close, the horse nickered. With a smile, Zed rubbed her gray nose. Good girl. From inside the house came a low growl, interspersed with angry clicks. Something heavy thudded to the floor, accompanied by a thick oath in a foreign tongue. Come out from under there, you vile beast! Zed grinned at the sound of the familiar raspy voice. He watched the horse stroll off a ways to graze on tufts of dry grass, lifting her head while she chewed to look back toward the house at each sharp thump. Zed sauntered up the curving walk toward the house. He paused, turning full around twice to admire the beauty of the surrounding woods. They truly were a wonder, calm and peaceful in a place that had been a pass through one of the most dangerous spots in the world, the boundary. But the boundary was gone now. Yet the woods were a serene refuge, imbued with an almost palpable tranquility that Zed knew wasn't natural. They had been infused with those qualities at the skilled hands of the woman who at that very moment was throwing curses bold enough to make a battle-hardened Sandarian lancer blush. And he had seen one of those curse his own queen into a dead faint. That, of course, had only earned the man the rope. The fellow had had a few things to say to the hangman, too, which in turn didn't bring him a clean drop, but did offer him the opportunity to get off one last eloquent, if vulgar, oath. The other lancers seemed to think the trade worth the price. For her part, the queen never seemed to fully recover her delicate air, and thereafter always flushed a fabulous red at the mere sight of one of her lancers, needing to be fanned furiously by her attendants in order to remain conscious. She would probably have had them all hanged had they not saved her throne, to say nothing of her dainty neck, on more than one occasion. But that was a long time ago, in another war. Clasping his hands together behind himself, Zed inhaled deeply, relishing the clean, crisp air. Bending over, he plucked a dry, wilted, wild rose, and with a wisp of magic, brought it to fresh bloom. The yellow petals spread and swelled with new vitality. Closing his eyes, he took a deep whiff of the flower, and then idly stuck it in his robes, over his breast. He was in no hurry. It was not wise to interrupt a sorceress in a snit. Through the open door came a more serious curse, as the object of the sorceress's ire was at last brought to account. With a whack from the blunt end of an axe, the thing was sent flying through the doorway. The small armored beast landed on its back at Zed's feet. Wobbling, it clicked and growled as it raked the air with its claws, trying to right itself. It appeared no worse for the axe, or for its brief flight and rough landing. Filthy gripper. It was a gripper that had attached itself to Addie's ankle before. Once a gripper had you, there was virtually no way to get it off. It held on with those claws and rasped its teeth into you down to bone, sucking your blood with its puckered fang-ringed mouth. They never let go as long as there was blood to feed on, and that armor shed any counterattack. Addie had used an axe to chop off her foot where the gripper had been attached, chopped off her own foot to save her life. Thinking about it turned his stomach. He watched the beast at his feet for a moment, then gave it a casual kick, sending it a goodly distance. Landing right side up, it waddled off into the woods in search of easier prey. Zed looked up at the figure standing in the doorway, scowling at him with her completely white eyes, her breast still heaving. She wore robes the same light burlap color as his, but unlike his, hers were decorated at the neck with yellow and red beads, sewn in the ancient symbols of her profession. She put her fists on her hips. The scowl held a firm grip on her features, not that it diminished in the least how handsome they were. She still held the axe in one hand, though, a worrisome sign. Best not to trouble her too quickly with what he wanted. Zed smiled. You really shouldn't play with grippers, Addie. That's how you lost your foot the last time, you know. He plucked the yellow rose from its place at his chest. His thin lips pushed his wrinkled cheeks back farther as his smile widened. Got anything to eat? I'm starving. She watched him silently for a moment without moving, then slipped the axe head to the floor and leaned the handle against the wall just inside the door. What do you be doing here, wizard? Zed stepped onto the tiny porch and gave a dramatic bow. When he came up, he offered her the flower as if it were a priceless jewel. I just couldn't stay away from your tender embrace, dear lady. 
he flashed his most irresistible smile. Addie studied him a moment with those white eyes. That be a lie. Zed cleared his throat and pressed the flower closer. He thought maybe he needed to practice his smile. Is that stew I smell? Without taking her gaze from him, she accepted the flower, sticking it in her straight jaw-length black and gray hair. She truly was handsome. It be stew. Her soft, thin hands took his. A small smile stole onto her finely wrinkled face, and she gave a slight nod. It be good to see you again, Zed. For a time I feared I never would. I spent many a night in a sweat, knowing what would happen had you failed. When winter came and the magic of Orden didn't sweep the land, I knew you had succeeded. Zed was encouraged that his best smile hadn't been wasted after all, but he was careful with his answer. Dark and Rahl has been defeated. What of Richard and Kalen? Do they be safe? Zed puffed up with pride. Yes. In fact, Richard was the one who defeated Dark and Rahl. She nodded again. I think there be more to the story. He shrugged, trying to make it seem less important than it was. A bit of a tale. Though the small smile still rested easily on her face, her white eyes seemed to be weighing his soul. And there be a reason you be here, a reason I fear I won't like. He pulled his hands out of hers and pushed some of his unruly, wavy white hair back while frowning. Bags, woman, are you going to feed me any of that stew or not? Addie finally withdrew her white eyes from him and turned back into her home. I think there be enough stew even for you. Come in and shut the door. I do not wish to see another gripper tonight. Invited in. Well, things were going smoothly. He wondered how much he was going to have to tell her. Not all, he hoped. Wizards work using people. The worst of it was using people he liked, especially people he liked deeply. As Zed helped her right the chairs and table and pick up the pots and tin plates strewn about the floor, he began telling her of the things that had happened since he had been with her last. He started with the harrowing tale of going through the pass, protected somewhat by the bone she had given him to hide from the beasts. He still had the bone on a thin leather thong around his neck, seeing no need to be rid of it after he had gotten safely through. She listened without comment as he wove the tale, and when he told of Richard's capture by the moored Sith, she didn't turn to show her face, but he saw the muscles in her shoulders tense for the briefest of moments. With no small amount of emphasis to make his point, he related how Dark and Rahl had taken the Nightstone from Richard, the Nightstone she had given him to see him safely through the pass. He scowled at her back as she picked a plate off the floor. I was nearly killed by that stone. Dark and Rahl used it to trap me in the underworld. I escaped by the thinnest of hairs. You almost got me killed giving that thing to Richard. Do not be a thick-headed fool, she scoffed. You'll be smart enough to save yourself. Had I not given the Nightstone to Richard, he would have died in the pass, and then Dark and Rahl would have won, and right now would no doubt be torturing you. You would soon be dead. By giving the stone to Richard, I saved your life. He shook a leg bone of some sort at the glance she cast over her shoulder. That thing was dangerous. You shouldn't go handing out dangerous things as if they were a stick of candy. Not without warning people, anyway. He had a right to be indignant. He had been the one sucked into the underworld by that wretched stone. The woman could at least pretend to be contrite. Zed went on with the story of how Richard had escaped, although he had a web around him hiding his identity, and how the quads had attacked Chase, Kalen, and himself. He had to make an effort to control his voice at the telling of what had almost happened to Kalen, and how she had called forth the Kondar and killed their attackers. He finished with how Richard had tricked Dark and Rahl into opening the wrong box. He told her how the magic of Orden had taken Dark and Rahl for his mistake. Zed smiled to himself as he reached the end of his story, telling her that Richard had somehow gotten past Kalen's power and that they were free to love each other. He wasn't about to tell her how. That was not for anyone to know, and they were happily together now. He was pleased that he had managed to tell the story without having to delve too deeply into some of the more painful events. He didn't want to have to revisit some of those hurts. She didn't ask any questions, but came and put a hand on his shoulder, saying that she was relieved all of them had survived and won. Zed was silent after the telling, at least as much as he wanted to tell, of the tale. 
He set to stacking the pile of loose bones into the corner where she said they belonged. By the way they were scattered about, the gripper must have sought refuge in them. A sorry mistake. That people called Addie the Bone Woman was small wonder. The house had little else in it. Her life seemed devoted to bones. A sorceress dedicated to bones was a troubling concept. He saw little evidence of potions, powders, or the usual type of charms, any of the typical things he knew to expect from a woman of her talents. He knew what she was probing into, just not why. Sorceresses usually confined their concerns to things living. She was a searcher into things dark and dangerous, things dead. Unfortunately, that was what he was doing, too. If you wanted to know about fire, you had to study it, he guessed. Of course, it was a good way to get burned. He knew he didn't like the analogy the moment it popped into his head. He looked up from the bone pile as he placed the last of them. If you don't want grippers in your house, Addy, you should keep your door closed. His perfectly apt, scolding frown was wasted, and she didn't turn from her task of stacking the firewood back in its bin at the side of the hearth. The door be closed and bolted, she said in her dry rasp, in a tone seemingly meant to wither his unseen scowl. This be the third time. Picking up a bone that had been hiding behind a stick of firewood, she straightened and carried it to him. Before, the grippers never came near my house. Her voice lowered as if in a threat to unseen ears. I saw to that. She handed over the thick white rib bone, peering down at him as he squatted on the floor next to the bone pile. Now, since winter, they come near. The bones no longer seem to keep them away. The reason be a mystery to me. Addie had lived in this pass a long time. No one knew as well as she its dangers, its quirks, its vagaries. None knew better than she what it took to be safe here, to live on the cusp between the world of the living and the world of the dead, at the edge of the underworld. Of course, the boundary was gone now. It should be safe here now. He wondered what else was going on that she wasn't telling him. Sorceresses never told all they knew. What was she doing still living here with strange and dangerous things happening? Stubborn woman. Sorceresses, the lot of them. Addie limped slightly as she walked across the room, lit only by the fire. Light the lamp. Following behind... Zed swept a hand in the direction of the table. The lamp lit itself, adding a soft glow to that of the fire in the large hearth made of smooth river stones, and helped illuminate the dark walls of the room. Every wall held white bones. Shelves lined one wall and were stuffed to overflowing with the skulls of dangerous beasts. Many of the bones had been made into ceremonial objects. Some had been made into necklaces, decorated with feathers and beads, and some had been inscribed with ancient symbols. Some had spells drawn on the wall around them. It was the oddest collection he had ever seen. Zed pointed a bony finger down at her foot. Why are you limping? Addie gave him a sidelong glance as she stopped and lifted a spoon from a hook set into the mortar at the side of the fireplace. The new foot you grew me be too short. Zed stood with one hand on a knobby hip and the stick-like fingers of the other holding his smooth chin as he looked down at her foot. He hadn't noticed it wasn't long enough when he had grown it back. He had needed to leave soon after it was done. Maybe I could grow the ankle a little longer, he wondered aloud. He took his hand from his chin and flourished it in the air. Make them even, Addie glared over her shoulder as she stirred the stew. No, thank you. Zed arched an eyebrow. Wouldn't you appreciate having them both even? I appreciate you growing my foot back for me. Life be easier with two of them. I did not realize how much I hated that crutch. But the foot be fine the way it is. She lifted the long-handled spoon to her lips, blowing on the hot stew. It would be easier if they were even. I said no. She tasted the stew. Bags, woman, why not? Addie tapped the spoon clean on the edge of the iron kettle and hung it back on its hook then lifted a dented tin from the side of the mantel, unscrewing the lid. Her voice was quiet, her rasp softer. I do not wish to revisit that pain. Had I known what it would be like, I would have chosen to live the rest of my life without the foot. Reaching her hand into the tin, she took a three-finger and thumb pinch of five spice and flung it into the stew. Zed tugged at his ear. Perhaps she was right. Growing the foot back for her had nearly killed her. He hadn't expected what had happened, 
her reaction to his using that much magic on her. Still, he had been successful and managed to draw away the pain of the memories, though he still didn't know what they had been about. But he should have taken into account that she could have had memories that held that much pain. He should have taken the wizard's second rule into account, but he had been intent on doing something good for her. That was the way it worked with the second rule. It was usually hard to tell if you were violating it. You know the price of magic, Addie, almost as well as a wizard. And besides, I made it up to you. For the pain, I mean. He knew it wouldn't take as much magic to make the ankle longer as it had to grow the foot back. But after what she had suffered, he could understand her reluctance. Perhaps you are right. Maybe I have done enough. Her white eyes settled on him again. Why be you here, wizard? He gave her an impish grin. I wanted to see you. You are a hard woman to forget. And I wanted to tell you about Dark and Rahl being defeated by Richard, that we won. He frowned at her stare. Why do you think the grippers are coming here? She shook her head with a sigh. You talk like a drunk man walks in every direction but where he beheaded. She flicked a finger toward the table, indicating that she wanted him to get the bowls. I already knew we won. The first day of winter has come and passed. Had Rawl won, things wouldn't be so peaceful as they are. Though I be pleased to see your bones again. Her voice lowered, became even more raspy. Why be you here, wizard? He strode over to the table, glad to elude the scrutiny of those eyes for a moment. You didn't answer my question. Why do you think the grippers are coming here? Her voice lowered into a deeper, harsher rasp, bordering on anger. I think the grippers be here for the same reason you be here, to cause an old woman trouble. Zed grinned as he returned with bowls. My eyes don't see an old woman. They see only a handsome woman. She regarded his grin with a helpless shake of her head. I fear your tongue be more dangerous than a gripper. He handed her a bowl. Have the grippers ever come here before? No. She turned and began spooning stew into the bowl. When the boundary be in place, the grippers stayed in the pass with other beasts. After the boundary went down, I not see them for a time, but when winter came, so did the grippers. That not be right. I think something be wrong. He exchanged the empty bowl for the full, holding it to his nose and inhaling the aroma. Maybe when the boundary finally failed, there was no longer any hold over them, and they simply came out of the pass. Maybe. When the boundary failed, most of the beasts went with it back into the underworld. Some were freed of their bonds and escaped into the surrounding country. I never saw any grippers until the winter came, nearly a month ago. I fear something else happened for them to be here. Zed knew very well what had happened, but didn't say so. Instead, he asked, Addie, why don't you leave? Come with me to Aiden Drill. It would be... No! Her mouth snapped closed. She seemed almost surprised by her own voice. She smoothed her robe with her hand, letting the anger leave her face, and then took the spoon out of the hand with the bowl and returned to dishing out stew. No, this be my home. Zed watched silently as she worked over the kettle. When finished, she carried her bowl to the table, set it down, and retrieved a loaf of bread from over the counter from a shelf behind a blue and white striped curtain. She pointed with the bread to the other empty chair. Zed set his bowl on the table and sat, hiking his robes up as he folded his legs underneath himself. Addie lowered herself into the chair opposite him and sliced off a chunk of bread, using the knife point to push it across the table before she looked up to meet his eyes. Please, Zed, do not ask me to leave my home. I am only worried for you, Addie. Addie dunked a chunk of bread in her stew. That be a lie. He looked up from under his eyebrows as he picked up his bread. It's not a lie? She ate without lifting her head. Only be a lie. Zed went back to his stew and ate in earnest. Mmm, this is wonderful, he mumbled around a hot chunk of meat. She nodded her thanks. He ate until his bowl was empty, then took it to the fireplace and filled it once more. On his way back to the table, he swept his hand around at the room, pointing with his spoon. You have a lovely home, Addie, quite lovely. He sat and picked up the bread she passed to him. He put his elbows on the table, his sleeves slipping up his forearms as he broke the bread in half. 
But I don't think you should be living here all alone, not with the grippers and all. He gestured with the bread to the north. Why don't you come with me to Aden Drill? It's a lovely place, too. You would like it there. There's plenty of room. Kalen could see to it that you have your choice of places to live. Why, you could even stay in the keep if you preferred. Her white eyes stayed on her meal. No. Why not? We could have a good time there. A sorceress could have a grand time in the keep. There are books and... I said no. He watched her as she went back to eating stew. He pushed his sleeves up farther and did the same. He couldn't eat long. He set the spoon in the bowl and looked up from under his eyebrows. Addie, there is more to the story, more I haven't told you. She lifted an eyebrow. I hope you do not expect me to look surprised. I not be good at pretending. She bent back over her bowl. Addie, the veil is torn. Her hand paused with the spoon halfway to her mouth. She didn't look up. Bah, what do you know of the veil? You do not know what you speak of. The spoon completed its journey. I know it's torn. She scooped up the last piece of potato from her bowl. You speak of things that are not possible, wizard. The veil not be torn. She stood, picking up her empty bowl. Be at ease, old man. If the veil be torn, we would have a lot more than grippers to be worried about. But we don't. Zed turned, putting a hand on the back of his chair, watching her limp toward the kettle hanging from the crane in the fireplace. The stone of tears is in this world, he said in a quiet voice. Addie halted. Her bowl fell to the floor, clattering in the thick silence, and rolled away. Her hands were held out before her, as if she still held it. Her back was stiff. Do not say such a thing aloud, she whispered, unless you be certain beyond doubt, unless you be certain on your honor as first wizard, unless you be willing to offer your soul to the keeper if you be lying. Zed's fierce hazel eyes watched her back. I pledge my soul to the keeper if I'm telling you a lie. May he take me this instant. The stone of tears is in this world. I have seen it. Dear spirits, protect us, she whispered weakly. Still, she did not move. Tell me what fool thing you have done, wizard. Addy, come and sit down. First, I want you to tell me what you are doing living here in the pass, or what used to be the pass. What you have been doing living at the edge of the underworld, and why you won't leave. She spun to face him, one hand gripping the skirt of her robe. That be my business. With his hand on the chair back, Zed pushed himself to his feet. Addie, I must know. This is important. I must know what you have been doing, so that I may know if it can be a help. I know very well the pain you live with. I saw it, remember? I don't know what caused it, but I know how deep it is. I would ask you to share the story with me. I ask you as a friend to confide in me. Please, don't make me ask as first wizard. Her eyes rose to meet his at the last of what he said. The flash of anger faded, and she nodded. Very well. Perhaps I have kept it to myself too long. Perhaps it would be a relief to tell someone, a friend. Perhaps you will not want my help after you hear. If you still do, I expect you to tell me all that has happened. She thrust a finger in his direction. All. Zed gave her a small smile of encouragement. Of course. She limped to her chair. Just as she sat down, the largest skull on the shelves suddenly thudded to the floor. Both stared at it. Zed walked over and picked it up in both hands. His thin fingers stroked tapered, curved fangs as long as his hand. The skull was flat on the bottom. It shouldn't have been able to roll off the shelf. He replaced it solidly as Addie watched. It seems, she said in her rasp, that the bones want to be on the floor lately. They keep falling down. Zed returned to his chair after a final frown to the skull. Tell me about the bones, why you have them, what you do with them, everything. Start at the beginning. Everything. She folded her arms across her lap, briefly looking as if she wanted to run for the door. It be a painful story to tell. Not a word of it will ever touch my lips, Addie. Chapter 22 Addie drew a long breath. 
I be born in the town of Chura, in the land of Nicobarees. My mother did not have the gift of sorcery. She be a skip, as it be called. My grandmother Lindell be the one before me to have it. My mother be grateful to the good spirits. She be a skip, but bitter at them that I be gifted. In Nicobarees, those with the gift be loathed and distrusted. It be thought the gift be allied to the flows of power, not only from the Creator, but also from the Keeper. Even ones using the gift for good be suspected of being a baneling. You know of the banelings, yes? Zed tore off a piece of bread. Yes. Ones turn to the Keeper, sworn to him. They hide in the light as well as the shadows, serving his wishes, working to his ends. They can be anyone. Some work for good for years, hiding, waiting to be called. But when they are called, they do the keeper's bidding. They are also called by different names, but they are all agents of the keeper. Some books call them that, agents. Some are important people, like Dark and Rahl, used for important tasks. Some are everyday people, used for dirty little deeds. Those with the gift, like Dark and Rahl, are the most difficult for the keeper to turn. Those without it are easier, but even they are rare. Eddie's eyes widened. Dark and Rahl be a baneling. Zed lifted an eyebrow as he nodded. Admitted it to me himself. He said he was an agent, but it's the same thing whenever the word. And I've heard any number. They all serve the keeper. This be dangerous news. Zed sopped up some stew with a piece of bread. I bring very little of any other kind. You were saying about your grandmother Lindell? In the time of grandmother Lindell's youth, sorceresses be put to death for anything that fate brought. Sickness, accidents, stillbirths. Put to death wrongly for being banelings. Some of the gifted fought back at being wrongly persecuted. They fought well. It deepened the hatred and only served to confirm the fears of many of the Nicobarese people. At last, there was a truce. Nicobarese leaders agreed to let the gifted women be, if they would give a sole oath as a way of proving they not be banelings, an oath not to use their power unless permission be granted by a governing body, the king's circle of their town, for instance. It be an oath to the people, an oath not to use the gift and bring the keeper's notice. Zed swallowed a mouthful of stew. Why would people think sorceresses were banelings? Because it be easier to blame a woman for their troubles than to admit the truth, and more satisfying to accuse than to curse the unknown. Those with the gift use power that can help people, but it can also be used to harm them. Because it can be used to harm, it be believed the power must be given, at least in part, by the keeper. Superstitious nonsense, he growled. As you well know, superstition needs no grounding in truth, but once rooted, it grows a strong, though twisted, tree. He grunted his assent. So, no sorceress used her power? Abby shook her head. No, unless it be for some common good, and they went before the king's circle of their town first and asked permission. Every sorceress went before the circle of their town or district and swore an oath to the people, an oath on her soul to abide by the wishes of the people, swore a solemn oath not to use her power on or for another unless asked to do so by the agreement of the circle. Zed put a spoon down in disgust. But they had the gift. How could they not use it? They used it, but only in private, never where anyone could see and never on another. Zed leaned back in his chair, shaking his silver head in silent wonder at the wizard's first rule, at the things people would believe while Addie went on. Grandmother Lindell be a stern woman who lived by herself. She never wanted anything to do with teaching me about using the gift. She told me only to let it be. And my mother, of course, could teach me nothing. So I learned on my own as I grew, as the gift grew. But I knew very well the wickedness of using it. I'd be lectured on that almost every day. To use the gift in a manner not permitted was made to seem like touching the taint of the keeper himself. And I believed it so. I feared greatly going against what I be taught. I be a fruit of the tree of that superstition. One day, when I be eight or nine, I be in the town square with my mother and father on market day, and across the square a building caught fire. 
There be a girl about my age on the second floor, trapped by the flames. She screamed for help. No one could reach her because the fire be all through the first floor. Her screams of terror burned every nerve in me. I started to cry. I wanted to help. I could not stand the screams. Addie folded her hands in her lap and looked down at the table. I made the fire go out. The girl be saved. Zed watched her placid expression as she stared at the table. I don't suppose anyone except the girl and her parents were happy? Addie shook her head. Everyone knew I had the gift. They knew it'd be me who had done it. My mother stood and cried. My father just stood looking the other way. He would not look at me as an agent of the keeper's evil. Someone went for Grandmother Lindell. She was respected because of how she stood by the oath. When Grandmother Lindell came, she took me and the girl before the men of the King's Circle. Grandmother Lindell switched the girl who I saved. She bawled a good long time. Zed was incredulous. She beat the girl? Why? For letting the keeper use her to bring forth the use of the gift, Hattie sighed. The girl and I had known each other, had been friends of a sort. She never spoke to me again. Addie hugged her arms across her stomach. And then Grandmother Lindell stripped me naked in front of those men and switched me until I was covered with welts and blood. I screamed more than the girl had in the fire. Then she marched me naked and bloody through the town to her house. The humiliation be worse than the beating. When we got to her house, I asked how she could be so cruel. She looked down her nose at me looked at me with that puckered, angry face of hers and said, Cruel, child? Cruel? You got not one switch more than you deserved, and not one less than what it took to keep you from being put to death by those men. Then she made me give the oath. I swear on my hope of salvation never to use the gift on another for any reason without the permission of the king or one of his circles and upon forfeit of my soul to the keeper should I ever use the gift to harm another. And then she shaved my head bald. I'd be kept bald until I grew to the age of a woman. Bald? Why? Because in the Midlands, as you know, the length of a woman's hair shows her social standing. It'd be meant to show me and everyone else that there be no one lower than I. I had used the gift publicly without permission. It'd be a constant reminder of the wrong I had done. I lived with Grandmother Lindell from then on. I only rarely saw my mother and father. At first, I missed them greatly. Grandmother Lindell taught me how to use the gift so I would be able to know it well, to be able to know what I was not to do. I did not like Grandmother Lindell much. She be a cold woman, but I respected her. She be fair after a fashion. If she punished me, and she did, it be only because I broke her rules. She switched me hard, but only for an infraction I be warned of. She taught me. She guided me in the gift. But she never gave me a kindness. It'd be a hard life, but I learned discipline. Most of all, I learned to use the gift. For that, I will always be thankful to her. For that, be my life. The gift be touching something higher, something more noble than what I be. I'm sorry, Eddie. He started eating his cold stew because he didn't know what else to do. He wasn't hungry anymore. Addie rose from her chair and walked to the fireplace, staring into the flames for a time. Zed waited silently for her to find the words. After I reached the age of a woman, I'd be allowed to let my hair grow. She smiled a small smile. At that age, as I filled into my form, I'd be thought an attractive woman. Zed pushed the bowl of stew away and went to stand by her, putting a hand on her shoulder. No less attractive now, dear lady. She put a hand over his without looking from the flames. In time, I fell in love with a young man. His name be Pell. He be an awkward young man, but a good and noble man, and he be kindness itself to me. He would have brought me the ocean one spoonful at a time if he thought it would please me. I thought the sun rose to show me his face, and the moon came out to let me taste his lips. Every beat of my heart be for him. We wanted to be wed. The king's circle of Chura, led by a man named Mathrin Galeen, had other ideas. She took her hand away and gripped a knot of robes at her stomach. They had decided I was to be wed to a man from the next town, the son of their mayor. I was a prize to the people of Chura, having a sorceress bonded to a people by her oath was seen as a sign of the virtue of those people. 
To give me an important man from a larger town was cause for excitement, joy, expectation. It would seal our towns in many ways, not the least of which was valuable trade. I'd be in a panic. I went to Grandmother Lindell and begged her to intercede for me. I told her of my love for Pell and that I did not wish to be a prize in return for trade. I told her the gift was mine and not to be used to bind me into slavery. A sorceress, not be a slave. Grandmother Lindell was a sorceress. The gift in her be disdained, but people respected her because she be devoted to her oath, and they held more than a healthy respect for her. She be feared. I pleaded for her help. Doesn't seem like the kind of person to help you. There be no one else to turn to. She made me leave her for one day so she could think on it. It be the longest day of my life. When I came to her at the end of the day, she told me to kneel before her and give the oath. She told me I had better mean it more than any time I had ever said it before, and she had made me say it often. I knelt and said the oath, meaning every word. When I finished, I held my breath and waited. I still be on my knees. She looked down her nose at me, that sour frown of hers still on her face, and then she said, Though you be wild of spirit, child, you have work to tame it. The people have asked for your oath, and you have given it. May I not live to see you break it. You owe no debt beyond that. I will take care of the circle and see to Mathrin Galeen. You will wed Pell. I wept into the hem of her dress. Addie was silent, staring into the fire, lost in the memories. Zed lifted an eyebrow. Well, did you wed your love? Yes, she whispered in her soft rasp. She took the spoon off its hook and stirred the stew while Zed watched her. At last, she hung it back at its place. For three months I thought life be beyond bliss. Her mouth worked soundlessly as she stared into nothingness. Zed put an arm around her shoulder and gently led her back to the table. Sit, Addie. Let me bring you a cup of tea. She was still sitting, her hands folded together on the table, staring off when he returned with the steaming cups. He placed one in her thin hands as he sat opposite her. He didn't press her to go on before she was ready. At last she did. One day, the day of my birth and nineteen years, Pell and I had taken a walk in the country. I be with child. She lifted the cup in both hands and took a sip. We spent the day walking past farms, thinking of names for our child, holding hands, and, well, you know the foolishness of love at that age. On our way back, we had to walk past the Chura Mill, just outside of town. I thought it strange no one be there. Someone always be at the mill. Addie closed her eyes for a moment, and then took another sip of tea. As it turned out, there be people there. The blood of the fold. They be waiting for us. Zed knew of them. In the larger cities of Nicobarese, the blood of the fold were an organized core of men who hunted banelings, rooted out evil as they saw it. In other lands, there were people like them who went by other names, but they were the same. None were especially picky about proof. A corpse was the only proof they need show of their job well done. If they said the body was that of a baneling, then it was. In the smaller towns, the blood were usually self-appointed toughs and thugs. The blood of the fold were widely feared, with good reason. They took us, her voice broke, but only that once, into separate rooms in the bottom of the mill. It be dark and smelled of the damp stone walls and grain dust. I did not know what be done to Pell. I be almost too terrified to breathe. Mathrin Galeen said Pell and I be banelings. He said I would not wed as I should have because I wished to bring the keeper's notice to Chura. There be a sickness, a fever in the country that summer, and it brought death to many a family. Mathrin Galeen said Pell and I brought the sickness. I denied it be so and spoke the oath to show proof. Addie turned the cup in her fingers as she stared at it. Zed touched her hand. Drink, Addie, it will help you. He had put a pinch of cloud leaf into her tea to help relax her. She took a long swallow. Matherin Galeen said Pell and I be banelings, and the graveyard be full of the proof of that. He said he wanted only for Pell and I to tell the truth, to confess. The other men of the blood be growling like hounds around a rabbit ready to tear us apart. I be terrified for Pell. As they beat me, I knew they would be doing worse to him. To make him name me a baneling. Nothing be better for the blood than to have someone name a loved one as a baneling. They would not listen when I denied it. She looked up into his eyes. 
they would not listen. Anything you said, Zed offered quietly, would make no difference, Addy. It wouldn't have mattered. When you are in a leg-hold trap, reasoning with the steel does no good. She nodded. I know. Her face was a calm mask over a thunderhead. I could have stopped it had I used the gift, but it'd be against everything I'd be taught, believed. It'd be as if using the gift would prove to myself that what the men said be true. I felt it would have been blasphemy against the Creator. I'd be as helpless while the men beat me as if I did not have the gift. She drained the tea from her cup. Even as I screamed, I could hear Pell's screams echoing from another room. Zed went to the fire and brought the pot back, filling her cup again. It wasn't your fault, Addie. Don't blame yourself. She flicked a glance up at him as he poured himself another cup. They wanted me to name Pell as a baneling. I told them I would not, that they could kill me, but they could not make me say that it be so. Matherin bent close to me, put his face close to mine. In my head I can still see his smile. He said, I believe you, girl, but it doesn't matter, because it not be you we want to name the baneling. It be Pell we want to speak the name of the baneling. It be you we want Pell to name. You be the baneling. Then the men held me down. Matherin tried to pour something down my throat. It burned my mouth. He held my nose. It be swallow or drown. I wished to drown, but I swallowed without wanting to. It burned my throat like swallowing fire. I could not speak. I could not make a sound. I could not even scream. No sound be there, only burning pain. More pain than I had ever known. She took a sip of tea as if to soothe her throat. Then the man took me in the room with Pell and tied me to a chair in front of him. Mothrin held me by my hair so I could not move. It broke my heart to see what they had done to my Pell. His face be white as snow. They had cut off most of his fingers, one knuckle at a time. Her own fingers tightened around her cup as she stared into the vision. Matherin told Pell that I had confessed that Pell be a baneling. Pell's eyes be big looking at me. I tried to scream that it not be true, but no sound came. I tried to shake my head that it not be true, but Matherin held me so I could not. Pell told them he did not believe them. They cut off another finger. They told him they only do it because I named him, only do it on my word. Pell kept his eyes on me as he shook and kept telling them he did not believe them. They told Pell I had told them I wished him to be killed because he be a baneling. Still, Pell said he did not believe them. He said he loved me. Then he told Pell I had named him a baneling and that if it not be so, I could deny it and they would let us both go free. He told Pell that I had promised I would not deny it because he be a baneling and I wanted him to die for it. Pell screamed for me to tell them, screamed for me to deny it. He screamed my name, screamed for me to say something. I tried, but I could say nothing. My throat be fire. My voice did not work. Matherin held me by my hair. I could not move. Pell's eyes be big as he stared at me as I sat silent. Then Pell spoke to me. How could you do that to me, Addy? How could you name me a baneling? Then he cried. Matherin asked him to name me a baneling. He said that if he did, they would believe him over me because I had the gift and he would be freed. Pell whispered, I will not say that of her to save my life, even though she has betrayed me. Those words broke my heart. As she stared off at nothing, Zed noticed a candle on the counter behind her melt into a puddle. He could feel the waves of power radiating from her. He realized he was holding his breath. He eased it out. Matherin cut Pell's throat, she said simply. He severed Pell's head and held it before me. He said he wanted me to see what following the keeper had brought on Pell. He said it'd be the last thing he wanted me to ever see. The men held my head back and pulled my eyes open. Matherin poured the burning liquid in them. I be blinded. In that moment, something happened inside me. My Pell was gone. He died thinking I had betrayed him. My life was about to end. I suddenly realized how it be my own fault for holding to an oath, the life of my love, for an ignorant oath, for a foolish superstition. Nothing mattered anymore. Everything be gone to me. I turned the gift loose, turned the rage loose. I broke my oath not to use the gift to harm another. I could not see 
but I could hear. I could hear their blood hit the stone walls. I struck out wildly. I shredded every living thing in that room, be it man or mouse. I could not see, so I simply struck at any life I could feel. I could not tell if any had escaped. In a way, I'd be glad to be blind or seeing what I'd be doing. I might have stopped before I finished. When I'll be still, dead, I felt my way around the room, counting the bodies. One be missing. I crawled to my grandmother Lindell's. How I made my way, I cannot imagine, except to think the gift guided me. When she saw me, she'd be furious. She pulled me to my feet and demanded to know if I had broken my oath. Zed leaned forward. But you couldn't speak? How did you answer? Addie smiled a small, cold smile. I picked her up by the throat with the power of the gift and slammed her against the wall. I walked up to her and nodded my head. I squeezed her throat in anger. She fought me. She fought me with all her power, but I be stronger, much stronger. I never knew until that moment that the gift be different in different people. She be as helpless as a stick doll. But I could not hurt her as much as I wished to, for her asking that question before any other. I released her and sagged to the floor. I could stand no longer. She came to me and began tending to my wounds. She told me I had done wrong by breaking my oath, but that what was done to me was a more grievous wrong. I never feared Grandmother Lindell again, not because she'd be helping me, but because I had broken the oath. I'd be beyond the laws I had been taught, and because I knew I was stronger than she. From that day on, she'd be afraid of me. I think she helped me because she wanted me well, so I could leave. A few days later, Grandmother Lindell came home to tell me that she had been called before the king's circle and questioned. She said all the men at the mill, all the blood of the fold be dead except Matherin. He had escaped. She told the circle she had not seen me. They believed her, or said they did because they did not want to confront her and additionally a sorceress who had killed that many men in such a shocking manner. So they let her go about her business. Some of the tension seemed to ease from her shoulders. She studied the teacup a moment and then took another sip. She held the cup out for him to warm. Zed poured a little more. He idly wished he had put some of the powdered cloud leaf in his own tea. He didn't think that was the end of the story. I lost my child, Addie said in a soft rasp. Zed looked up. I'm sorry, Addie. She looked up to meet his eyes. I know. She took one of his hands in both hers after he set down the kettle. I know. She took her hands back. My throat healed. She touched her fingers lightly to her neck, then knitted them together. But it left me with a voice like dragging iron over rock. He smiled at her. I like your voice. Iron fits the rest of you. The ghost of a smile passed across her face. My eyes, though, did not grow better. I be blind. Grandmother Lindell not be as strong as me, but she be old and had seen many a trick with the gift. She taught me to see without my eyes. She taught me to see with the gift. It not be the same as eyes, but in some ways it be better. In some ways I see more. After I be healed, Grandmother Lindell wanted me to leave. She not be fond of living with one who had broken the oath, even though I be of her blood. She feared I would bring trouble. Whether from the keeper for breaking my oath or from the blood of the fold, she did not know, but she feared trouble would come because of me. Zed leaned back in his chair, stretching his tense muscles a bit. And did trouble come? Oh, yes, Addie hissed, raising her eyebrows as she leaned forward. Trouble came. Mathrin Galene brought them. Twenty blood of the fold, ones paid by the crown, professionals, battle-hard men, big men, grim-faced, savage men, all pretty on horseback in neat ranks with swords, shields, and banners, every spear held just so at the same angle, all pretty in their chain mail and polished breastplates, shining with the embossed crest of the crown, and all wearing helmets with red plumes that flicked as they rode, every horse white. I stood on the porch and watched with the eyes of the gift as they spread rank before me with perfect precision, like they'd be performing for the king himself. Every horse put every foot the same, stopping in a line at the lifting of a finger from the commander. They'd be spread out before me, ready, eager to do their grisly duty. Mathrin waited behind them on his horse, watching. The commander called out to me, "'You'll be under arrest as a baneling and are to be executed as such.' Addie lifted her head from the specters of her memory. 
her eyes meeting Zed's. I thought of Pell, my Pell. Her expression hardened into an iron mask. Not one sword cleared a scabbard, not one spear be leveled, not one foot touched the ground before they died. I swept the line from left to right one man at a time, everything I had into each in turn, quick as a thought. Thump, thump, thump. Every one except the commander. He sat still and stone-faced upon his white horse as men in armor crashed to the ground to each side of him. When it be finished, when the last shield had clattered into silence, I met his eyes. Armor, I told him, be of no use against a true baneling or a sorceress. It only be of use against innocent people. Then I told him he was to deliver a message to the king for me from one sorceress named Addy. In a calm, firm voice, he asked the message. I said, tell him that if he sends another of the blood of the fold to take me, it will be the last living order he ever gives. He looked at me for a moment without a hint of emotion in his cold eyes, and then he turned his horse and walked it away without looking back. Her gaze sank to the table. My grandmother turned her back to me. She told me to leave the shelter of her roof and never to return. A little wince touched Zed's face before he caught it at the thought of a sorceress with enough power to kill men in that fashion. It was exceedingly rare for a sorceress to be that strong in the gift. What of Mathrin? You didn't kill him? She shook her head. A humorless smile played across her lips. No. I took him with me. Took him with you? I bonded him to me, bonded his life to mine, bonded him so that he always knew where I be, and so that every new moon he was compelled to come to me, no matter where I be, no matter what he wished. He had to follow me, at least close enough, so that he could come to me every new moon. Frowning, Zed studied the dregs in his teacup. I met a man once in Winstead, the capital and crown seat of Kelton. His name was Mathrin. He was a beggar, missing the fingers on one hand, as I recall. He was blind. His eyes had been... Zed's eyes suddenly fixed on hers. She was watching him. His eyes had been gouged out. Addie nodded. Indeed they had. Her face was iron again. Every new moon he came to me, and I cut something off him, letting his screams try to fill the emptiness in me. Zed leaned back, his hands pressed to the tabletop. Iron, indeed. So, you made a new home in Kelton? No, I made no home. I traveled, seeking out women with the gift, ones who could help me in my studies. None knew very much of what I sought, but each knew at least a little that others did not. Mathrin followed, and every new moon he came to me, and I cut something else from him. I wanted him to live forever, to suffer forever. He be the one who beat me down there with his fists, so I would lose Pell's child. He be the one who killed Pell. He be the one who blinded me. Her white eyes shone red in the lamplight as she stared off again. He be the one who made Pell believe I had betrayed him. I wanted Mathrin Galene to suffer forever. Zed gestured vaguely with his hand. How long did he last? Addie sighed. Not long enough and too long. Zed frowned. One day a thought occurred to me. I had never used the gift to prevent Mathrin from killing himself. Why would he still come to me? Let me make him suffer like I did. Why would he not simply end it? So the next time he came and I cut something else off, I also cut the bond, cut his need to come the next time. But I did it in a way so as he would not notice, so he could simply forget about me if he wished. So... That was the last you saw of him? She gave a grim shake of her head. No. I thought it would be, but he returned with the next new moon. Returned when he needn't have. It made my blood run cold to wonder why. I decided that it'd be time for him to pay with his life for what he had done to me and Pell and all the others. But I resolved that before he gave me his life, he would give me the answer. In my travels, I had learned many things. Things for which I thought I would never have use. That night, I found use. I used them to learn what torture Mathrin feared above all others. The trick be used to learn fears, but be useless to learn other secrets. Against his will, the words tumbled out of him, his fears spilled out. 
I left him to sweat all that night and the whole next day while I went in search of the things I needed, the things he feared above all else. When I finally returned with him, he'd be nearly insane with fright. His fears be well founded. I asked him to confess his secret. He said no. I dumped out the sack, put the little cages and the other things in front of him as he sat naked and helpless on the floor. I picked up each, held it before his sightless face and described it told him what be in each little cage or basket or jar. Again I asked him to confess. He be sweating and panting and shaking, but he said no. Matherin thought I be bluffing, that I did not have the courage. Matherin be wrong. I steeled myself and brought his worst fears to life for him. Zed's brow bunched up into wrinkles. Curiosity won out over dread. What did you do? She lifted her head to look into his eyes. That be the one thing I will not tell you. It not be important anyway. Matherin would not talk and suffered so much that I almost stopped several times. Each time I wanted to stop, I thought about the last thing my eyes had seen before he blinded me. Pell's head held in Matherin's fist before me. Addie swallowed, her voice so low, Zed could hardly hear her. And... I remembered Pell's last words. I will not say that of her to save my life, even though she has betrayed me. She closed her eyes for a moment. They came open and she went on. Matherin be on the edge of death. I thought he was not going to tell me why he came to me. But just before he died, he became still, despite what was being done to him. And then he said he would tell me, because he be about to die, because this, too, had been by plan. I asked him again why he had come back. He leaned toward me. Don't you know, Addie, he asked me. Don't you know what I be? I be a baneling. I have been hiding right under your nose all this time. You have kept me near you all this time, and the keeper knew right where you be. The keeper lusts for those with the gift above all else. I had thought that that be it, that he be a baneling. I told him he had failed. It had done him no good as he be about to die for his crimes. He smiled at me. She leaned forward. Smiled! And he said, You be wrong, Addie. I have not failed. I have done the keeper's bidding. I have fulfilled my task. Perfectly. All this be my plan. I have made you do exactly as he wished. I shall be rewarded. I be the one who started the fire when you be little. I be the one who did those things to Pell, not because I thought him or you a baneling. I be the baneling. I did it to make you break your oath, to make you welcome the Keeper's hate into your heart. Breaking your oath be the first step, and look what you have done since. Look at what you be doing right now. Look at how far you have slipped toward him. You be within his grasp now. You may not have given him your oath, but you do his bidding. You have become what you hate. You have become me. You be a baneling. The keeper smiles upon you, Addie, and thanks you for welcoming him into your heart. Matherin slumped and fell back dead. Addie dissolved into tears, her head sagging into her hands. Zed unlocked his joints and swept around the table, holding her to him as he stood next to her, holding her head against his stomach, stroking her hair, comforting her as she cried. Not so, dear lady. Not so at all. She wept against his robes, shaking her head. You think you be so smart, wizard. You not be so smart as you think. You be wrong about this. Zed knelt beside her chair, holding her hands in his, looking up into her stricken face. I'm smart enough to know that the keeper, or one of his minions, would not let you have the satisfaction of knowing you had won a battle against him. But I, you fought back. You struck out from your hurt, not for a lust of the things you did, not for a want to help the keeper. Her brow wrinkled together with her effort to stop the tears. You be so sure, sure enough to trust one such as I? Zed smiled. I'm sure. I may not know everything, but I know you are no baneling. You are the victim, not the criminal. She shook her head. I not be so sure as you. After Matherin died, did you go on killing, seeking vengeance against any innocent? No, of course not. Had you been an agent, you would have given yourself over to the keeper, to his wishes, and gone on to hurt those who fought him. 
You are no baneling, dear lady. My heart weeps for the things the keeper took from you, but he did not take your soul. That is still yours. Put those fears aside. He held her hands and gave them soft squeezes. She didn't try to take her hands back, but let them stay in his, as if to soak up the comfort as they trembled. Addie wiped the tears from her cheek. Pour me some more tea, but no more powdered cloud leaf or I will fall asleep before I can finish the story. Zed arched an eyebrow. She had known what he had done. He patted her shoulder as he rose to his feet. He poured her tea and then pulled his chair forward and sat again while she sipped. After she drank half of her cup, she looked to have regained her control. The war with Dahara be burning hot, but it be near the end. I felt the boundary go up, felt it come into this world. So you came here right after the boundary went up? No. I studied with a few women first. Some taught me a few things about bones. She pulled a little necklace from under her robes. She fingered the small round bone with red and yellow beads to each side. It was just like the one she had given him to get him through the pass. He still wore it around his neck. This be a bone from the base of a skull like that on the shelf over there, the one that fell on the floor. The beast is called a scrin. Scrin be guardian beasts to the underworld, something like the heart hounds, except they guard in both directions. The best way to explain it is that they be part of the veil, though that not be accurate. In this world, they be solid, have form, but in the other, they be only a force. Zed frowned. Force? Addie held out her spoon and let it drop on the table. Force. We cannot see it, but force be there. It makes the spoon drop and keeps it from flying up into the air. It cannot be seen, but it be there. Something like that with the scrin. On rare occasions in their duty to repel all from the cusp where the world of the living and the world of the dead touch, they be pulled into this world. Few people know of them because it so rarely happens. Zed was frowning. It be very complex. I will explain it better another time. The important thing be that this bone from the scrin hides you from them. Addie took a sip of her tea while Zed put his necklace out of his robes, taking a new look at it. And it must hide you from other beasts, too, to get through the pass. She nodded. How did you know about the pass? I put the boundary up, and I didn't know the pass existed. She turned the teacup around and around in her fingers. After I left my grandmother, I sought out women with the gift, women who could teach me things about the world of the dead. After Matherin died, I studied harder with more urgency. Each woman could tell me only what small bit she knew, but they usually knew one who knew more. I traveled the Midlands, going among them, gathering knowledge. I collected all those bits of knowledge, piecing them together. In this manner, I learned a little of how the worlds interact. By putting up a boundary across parts of this world, it'd be a little like stoppering up a tea kettle and then putting it on the fire. Without a vent, something will blow off. I knew that if there be magic wise enough to know how to bring the underworld into this, it must have a way to equalize each side of the boundary. A vent of some sort. A pass. Zed lifted an eyebrow, staring off into his thoughts as he drew his thumb down his chin. Of course. That makes sense. Balance. All force, all magic must be balanced. He focused his eyes on her. When I brought up the boundary, I was using magic I didn't fully understand. It was in an ancient book from the wizards of old who had more power than I can fathom. Using their instructions to bring up the boundary was an act of desperation. It'd be hard for me to imagine you being desperate. Sometimes that's all life is, one desperate act after another. Addie nodded. Perhaps you be right. I was desperate to hide from the keeper. I remembered what Matherin had said. He be hiding right under my nose. I reasoned that the safest place for me to hide from the keeper would be where he wouldn't look, right under his nose, right at the edge of his world. So I came to the pass. The pass did not be this world, yet it did not be the underworld either. It be a mix of both. A place where both worlds boiled together a little bit. With the bones, I be able to hide from the keeper. He and the beasts from his world could not see me. Hide? The woman had more iron in her than the kettle hanging on the fire. 
If he knew Addie, there was more to it. Zed gave her a stern stare. You came here simply to hide? She averted her eyes as she fingered the small round bone on her necklace, and then at last tucked it back into her robes. There'd be another reason. I made an oath to myself. I swore I would find a way to contact my pal to tell him I did not betray him. She took a long swallow of tea. I have spent most of my life here in the pass trying to find a way to reach into the world of the dead to tell him. The pass be part of that world. Zed pushed at his cup with a finger. The boundary, the pass is gone, Addy. I need your help in this world. She laid her arms on the table. When you grew my foot back for me, it brought back everything that had happened, made it fresh, as if I be reliving it. It made me remember some things I had forgotten for a long time. It made me remember hurts that still be there, though time had dimmed them. I'm sorry, Addie, he whispered. I should have taken your past into consideration, but I didn't suspect you had lived through that much pain. Forgive me. There be nothing to forgive. You gave me a gift by giving me my foot back. You did not know the things I have done. It not be your fault I did them. You did not know I be a baneling. He cast her a harsh glare. You think that because you have fought back against wickedness, you have become wicked? I have done worse than a man like you can understand. Zed nodded slightly. Is that so? Let me tell you a little story. I had a love once, like your pal. Her name was Erelyn. My time with her was like your time with Pell. A slow smile came to his lips as his memory touched the mist of those pleasant times. The smile withered. Until Panis Ral sent a quad after her. Addie reached out and laid a hand on his. Zed, you do not need to... Zed brought his other fist down on the table, making the cups jump. You can't imagine what the four of them did to her. He leaned forward, his face standing out red against his white hair. He ground his teeth together. I hunted them down. What I did to each of them would make whatever you did to Matherin seem a lark. I went after Panis Ral, but couldn't reach him, so I went after his armies. For every man you killed, Addy, I killed a thousand. Even my own side feared me. I was the wind of death. I did what was needed to stop Panis Ral, and maybe more. He settled his weight back in the chair. If there is such a thing as a man of virtue, you do not sit with him now. You did only what you had to. That does not diminish your virtue. He arched an eyebrow. Wise words spoken by a wise woman. Perhaps you should listen to them. She remained silent. He put his elbows on the table and idly picked up the cup, rolling it in his palms as he went on. In a way, I was luckier than you. I had more time with my Erelyn, and I didn't lose my daughter. Panisral did not try to kill your daughter, too? Yes, indeed, he thought he had. I cast a death spell to make them think they had seen her death. It was the only way to protect her, to keep them from trying until they succeeded. A death spell, Addie whispered a benediction in her native tongue. That be a dangerous web. I would not reproach you for doing such a thing you had cause, but such a thing does not go unnoticed by the spirits. You be lucky it worked and it saved her. You be very fortunate the good spirits be with you on that day. I guess sometimes it's hard to tell which side of luck you're looking at. I raised her without a mother. She had grown into a fine young woman when it happened. Darken Rahl had been standing next to his father when I sent the wizard's fire through the boundary. He was standing next to his father when my fire found him. Some of it burned Darken Rahl. He spent his growing years learning so he could finish what his father had started and extract his vengeance. He learned how to cross the boundary. He was coming into the Midlands, and I never knew. He raped my daughter. He didn't know who she was. Everyone thought my daughter was dead, or he would have killed her, sure. But he hurt her. He pressed his palms together. The cup shattered. 
He turned his hands up to see if they had been cut and was a little surprised they weren't. And he said nothing. After that, I took her to Westland to hide, to protect her. I never knew if it was more of that bad luck or if somehow wickedness found her, but she died. Burned to death in her house. Though I always suspected the irony was more than coincidence, I never found proof it was so. Perhaps, after all, the good spirits hadn't been with me on the day I cast her death spell. I be sorry, Zed, Addie said in a soft rasp. He waved off her pity with a flourish of his hand. I still had her boy. With the side of his finger, he pushed the shards of the cup into a little pile in the center of the wooden tabletop. Darken Rahl's son, the spawn of an agent of the Keeper. But my daughter's son, too, and my grandson, innocent of the crimes that brought him to be. A fine boy. He looked up at her from under his bushy eyebrows. I believe you know him. His name is Richard. Addie lurched forward in her chair. Richard! Richard is your... She leaned back, shaking her head. Wizards and their secrets. She scowled a little, but then softened her expression. Perhaps you had just cause for a secret such as this. Does Richard have the gift? Zed lifted his eyebrows as he nodded. Indeed he does. That was one reason I hid him in Westland. I feared he had the gift, though I wasn't sure, and I wanted him to be safe from danger. As you said, the Keeper lusts for those with the gift more than any other. I knew that if I began teaching him, used magic very much myself, the gaze of danger would settle on him. I wanted to let him grow, become strong of character before I tested him, and if he had the gift, taught him. I had always suspected he had the gift. Sometimes I hoped he did not, but I know now he does. He used it to stop Dark and Rahl, used magic. He leaned forward. I suspect he has the gift from both his grandfather and his father, from two different lines of wizards. I see, was all she said. But we have more important things to worry about right now. Dark and Rao used the boxes of Orden. He opened one, the wrong one for him anyway. But maybe the wrong one for us too. There are books back at the keep that speak of it. They warn that if the boxes are used, if the magic of Orden is used, and even if the person who put them in play makes a mistake and it kills him, it can still tear the veil. Addie, I don't know as much about the underworld as you. You have been studying it most of your life. I need your help. I need you to come to Aidendril with me to study the books to see what can be done. I've read many of them and don't understand much of their meaning. Perhaps you will. Even if you only see one thing I miss, it could be important. She stared at the table with a bitter expression. I be an old woman. I be an old woman who has welcomed the keeper into my heart. Zed watched her, but she didn't meet his eyes. He pushed his chair back and stood. An old woman? No. A foolish woman? Maybe. She didn't reply. Her gaze stayed pointedly on the table. Zed strolled across the room and inspected the bones hanging on the wall. He clasped his hands behind his back as he studied the talismans of the dead. Maybe I am just an old man then, hmm? A foolish old man. Maybe I should let a young man do this work. He glanced over his shoulder. She was watching him. But if a young man is good, then even younger would be better. In fact, why not let a child do it? That would be better yet. Maybe there is a ten-year-old boy somewhere who would be willing to do something to stop the dead from swallowing the living. He threw his hands up in the air. According to you, it would seem knowledge is of no use, only youth. Now you are being foolish, old man. You know what I mean. Zed stepped back to the table and gave a shrug of his bony shoulders. If you just sit here in this house instead of helping with what you know, then you might as well be the thing you fear most. An agent of the Keeper. He put his knuckles to the table and glowered as he leaned over her. If you don't fight him, then you help him. That is what his plan has been all along. Not to turn you to him, but to make you fear stopping him. She looked into his eyes, uneasiness stealing into her expression. What do you mean? He has already done all he needed, Addie. 
He made you afraid of yourself. The Keeper has an eternity of patience. He doesn't need you to work for him. It takes effort to turn one with the gift. You weren't worth the trouble. He needed only for you not to work against him. He did all that was necessary. He didn't waste an effort to do more. In some ways, he is as blind to this world as we are to his. He has only so much influence here. He must choose his tasks carefully. He doesn't spend what power he has here frivolously. Realization took the place of unease. Perhaps you not be such an old fool. Zed smiled as he pulled the chair forward and sat. That has always been my opinion. Hands nestled in her lap, Addie studied the tabletop as if hoping it would come to her aid. The house was silent except for the slow crackle of the fire in the hearth. All these years the truth be hiding right under my nose. Age 262. She lifted her head, giving him a puzzled frown. How did you come to be so wise? Zed shrugged. But one of the advantages of having lived so long... You view yourself as just an old woman. I see a striking dear lady who has learned much in her time in this world and has gained wisdom from what she has seen. He pulled the yellow rose from her hair and held it before her. Your loveliness is not a mask layered over a rotten core. It blossoms from the beauty inside. She lifted the flower from her fingers and laid it on the table. Your clever tongue cannot cover the fact that I have wasted my life. Zed shook his head, cutting her off. No, you have wasted nothing. You simply have not seen the other side of things yet. In magic, in all things, there is a balance if we look for it. The keeper did as he did, sending a baneling to you to keep you from interfering in his work, and to plant a seed of doubt in you that would perhaps turn you to him one day. But in that, too, there was something to balance what he did. You came here to learn about the world of the dead in order to contact your pal. Don't you see, Addie? You were manipulated to prevent you from interfering with the Keeper's plans, but in so doing, the balance is that you have learned things that might be of aid in stopping him. You must not surrender to what he had done to you. You must strike back with what he has inadvertently given you. Her eyes glistened as she cast her gaze about her house, looking to the bone pile, the walls covered with talismans of the dead she had collected over the years, and to the shelves holding more yet. But my oath, my pal, I must reach him, tell him. He died thinking I betrayed him. If I cannot redeem myself in his eyes, then I be lost. My heart be lost. If I be lost, then the keeper will find me. Pell is dead, Addie. Gone. The boundary, the pass is gone. You would know better than I if it would have ever been any use in what you wanted. But in all these years, you have not found a way to make it so. If you wish to continue the pursuit of your oath, you will find no help here. Perhaps in Aidendrill you will. Helping to stop the Keeper does not mean you must break your oath to yourself. If my knowledge and help can be of any aid in what you seek, I offer it gladly. Just as you know things I do not, I know things you don't. I am, after all, the first wizard. Perhaps what I know will help you. Pell would not want you to bring him your message that you did not betray him if it meant you must betray everyone else. Addie picked up the yellow flower, twirling it between her finger and thumb a moment before setting it down again. Gripping the edge of the table, she pushed herself to her feet. She stood a moment and then lifted her gaze with her white eyes around the room once more. Smoothing her robes at her hips as if to make herself presentable, she limped around the table to stand behind his chair. Zed felt her hands rest on his shoulders. Unexpectedly, she leaned over and kissed the top of his head and smoothed his unruly hair with gentle fingers. Zed was relieved the fingers hadn't gone around his throat. He thought they might after some of the things he had said. Thank you, my friend, for hearing my tale and for helping me to find the meaning in it. My pal would have liked you. You both be men of honor. I accept your word that you will help me tell my pal. Zed twisted around in his chair, 
and raised his face to her soft smile and kind eyes. I will do whatever I can to help you keep your oath. You have my oath on that. Her smile widened as she smoothed down a stray lock of his white hair. Now, tell me of the Stone of Tears. We must decide what is to be done with it. Chapter 23 The Stone of Tears? Well, it is hidden. She gave a single firm nod. Good. It not be something to be loose in this world. Her brow wrinkled in a little frown. It be hidden well? It be safe? Zed winced a little. He didn't want to tell her. He knew what she would say, but he had promised. I put it on a chain. Put it on a chain and hung it around the neck of a little girl. I don't know exactly where she is right now. You touched it? Andy's eyes widened. The Stone of Tears. You touched it and hung it around the neck of a little girl? She gripped his chin firmly in her suddenly powerful fingers and leaned close to his face. You have hung the stone of tears, the stone that it be told was hung by the creator himself around the keeper's neck to lock him in the underworld. You hung that around a little girl's neck and let her wander off? Zed scowled defensively. Well, I had to do something with it. I couldn't just leave it lying about. And he smacked the palm of her hand to her forehead. Just as he makes me think him wise, he shows me he be a fool indeed. Dear spirit, save me from the hands you have placed me in. Zed shot to his feet. And just what would you have done with it? Well, I would have certainly given it more thought than you seem to have done. And I wouldn't have touched it. It be a thing from another world. She turned her back to him, shaking her head and whispering things in her foreign tongue. Zed shifted his robes, straightening them with a firm tug. I didn't have the luxury of time to give it any thought. We were attacked by a screeling. If I had left it there... Addy spun around. A screeling? You be full of good news, old man. She jabbed a finger against his chest. That still be no good excuse. You still should not have... Not have what? Not have picked it up? I should have let the screeling pick it up instead? Screelings be assassins. They not be there to take the stone. Zed jabbed a finger right back at her. You know that? Are you so sure? Would you have been willing to have risked everything on it? And if you were wrong, let the keeper have the stone to do with as he would? Are you so sure, Addy? Her hand dropped to her side as she stared at his frown. No, I guess not. It could be as you say. There be a chance the Screeling may have taken it. Perhaps you did the only thing you could do. She shook the finger at him. But to hang it around the neck of a little girl... And where would you have had me keep it? In my pocket? In the pocket of a wizard? In the pocket of one with the gift, where the keeper is sure to look first? Or perhaps you would have had me hide it in a place only I knew. Where, if a baneling gets his hands on me and somehow makes me talk, I could tell him it would be, so he could go and collect it. Addie folded her arms with a muttered curse. At last, her expression relaxed. Well, perhaps... Perhaps nothing. I had no choice. It was an act of desperation. I did the only thing I could do, given the circumstances. She let out a tired sigh, then nodded. You be right, wizard. You did the best you could have done. She patted the top of his shoulder. Foolish as it be, she added under her breath. Her hand gave a gentle push. Sit. Let me show you something. Zed sat as he watched her limp across the room toward the shelves. I would rather have done anything else, Addy, he said sorrowfully, than what I had to do. She nodded as she walked. I know. She stopped and turned. A screeling, you say? Zed nodded. You be sure it be a screeling? He arched an eyebrow. Yes, of course you be sure. Her brow creased in thought. Screelings be the keeper's assassins. They be single-minded and extremely dangerous but they not be very smart. They must have something to show them the one they be after, a way to find them. They not be good at searching in this world. How could the keeper know where you be? How could the screeling know to find you? Know it be you he be after? Zed shrugged. I don't know. I was where the boxes had been opened. 
but it had been some time since it had happened. There would be no way to know I was still there. And did you destroy the Screeling? Yes. That be good. The Keeper will not waste the effort to send another, not after you have proven you be able to defeat it. Zed threw his hands up. Oh, yes, just wonderful. Screelings are sent to eliminate a threat to the Keeper. It was probably sent to rid the Keeper of my meddling, just as the Keeper sent a Baneling to rid himself of your interference. You're right. He will not send another Screeling now that I have proven that I can defeat one. He will send something worse. If, indeed, it be sent for you. She touched a finger to her lower lip as she mumbled to herself. Where be the stone when you found it? Next to the box that had been opened. And where came the Screeling? In the same room as the boxes as the stone. She shook her head in puzzlement. Perhaps it could be, as you say, that it came to get the stone, but it makes no sense for a Screeling to come for the stone. I wonder how he found you. She limped on toward the shelves. Something had to guide him. Balancing on her toes, she peered to the back of a shelf, carefully pushing aside various objects, at last retrieving what she sought. Holding it in one hand, she limped back and placed it carefully on the table. It was a little bigger than a hen's egg, round and age-darkened, with a deep patina that was a brownish black in the recesses. It was masterfully carved into the shape of a vicious beast, all balled up, but glaring with eyes that seemed to watch you no matter which way it was held. It looked to be bone and very old. Zed picked it up, testing its weight. It was much heavier than he thought it should have been. What's this? A woman, a sorceress, gave this to me when I went to her to learn. She be on her deathbed. She asked if I knew of the scrin. I told her what I knew. She sighed with relief and then said something that made my skin prickle. She said she had been waiting for me, as the prophecies had told her to do. She placed this in my hand, saying it be carved from the bone of a scrin. Addie flicked her hand toward the walls and then toward the bone pile. I have a whole scrin here among the bones. I did battle with one once in the pass. His bones be here. His skull be on the shelf. It be the one that fell on the floor. She put a thin finger on the carved bone sphere in Zed's hand, as she leaned toward him and lowered her raspy voice. This, the old one said, must be guarded by one who understands. She told me it be of ancient magic made by wizards of old, possibly with their hand guided by the creator himself, made because of prophecies. She said it may be the most important thing of magic I would ever touch, that it be invested with more power than she or I would ever understand. She said that it be of scrin bone and of scrin force, that it be a talisman that be of importance if the veil ever be in danger. I asked how it was to be used, how the magic worked, and how it had come into her hands. She be very exhausted from the excitement of my coming to her and said she must rest. She told me to come back to her in the morning, and she would tell me everything she knew. When I returned, she had died. Addie gave him a meaningful look. Her death be a little too timely to suit me. Zed had had the same thought. But you have no idea what it is? Or how it is to be used? No. Already Zed was using magic to lift it on a cushion of air, floating it in space, watching it slowly spin. The whole time the finely carved eyes of the beast peered back as the ball revolved before him. Have you tried using any magic on it? I'd be afraid to try. Zed held his bony hands to each side of the floating carving, probing gently with different kinds of force, different sorts of magic, letting them shift and slide over the round bone, testing, searching gingerly for a crack, a shield, a trigger. It had the oddest feel to it. The magic reflected back as if it had touched nothing, as if the thing weren't there at all. Perhaps it could be a shield he had never seen before. He increased the force. It slipped against the carving like new shoe leather on ice. Addie wrung her hands. I do not think you should be... The flame of the lamp puffed out. A thin thread of greasy smoke curled from the abruptly dead wick. The room was left to the flickering shadows cast from the fire in the hearth. Zed frowned at the dark lamp. A sudden crash brought both their heads jerking around. The skull rolled across the floor toward where they sat. Halfway there it wobbled 
and rocked to a stop, right side up. Empty eye sockets stared up at the two of them. Long fangs rested on the wood floor. The carved bone ball thumped to the table, bouncing twice as Zed and Addie came to their feet. What foolish thing did you do, old man? Zed stared at the skull. I didn't do anything. More bones tumbled from the shelves. Bones hanging on the wall clattered to the floor, some bouncing and flipping back into the air as they struck. Zed and Addie both turned to a racket behind them. The bone pile rattled apart, bones toppling and spilling over one another as the pile pulled itself apart. Some of the bones, as if alive, slid or rolled across the floor toward the skull. Sliding along the floor, a rib bone caught the leg of a chair and spun around, but continued on. Zed twisted to Addie, but she was hurrying to the shelf above the counter behind the table, the one covered with the blue and white striped cloth. Addie, what are you doing? What's going on? Bones collected in increasing number around the skull. She yanked the cloth away, ripping it from its hooks. Leave before it be too late. What's going on? Jars and tins clanged together as she shoved them aside. She pushed her hand farther along the shelf, fingers searching blindly. Canisters thudded to the floor. A jar tumbled out, shattering on the edge of the counter, throwing sparkling shards of glass over the table and chairs. A thick, dark mass from the jar oozed over the edge of the counter, carrying splinters of glass with it, making it look like nothing more than a melting porcupine. Do as I say, wizard. Leave now! Zed rushed toward her, glass crunching under his feet. He jerked to a halt when he glanced over his shoulder toward the skull. It was level with his eyes, bones collecting and assembling under it as it rose into the air. A few rib bones ranked themselves. Vertebrae slipped into line, talons tipped claws, leg bones erected to the side of each flank. The jaw snapped into place as the skull rose toward the ceiling. Zed spun toward Addie, snatched her by the arm, yanking her toward him. She came away from the counter, clutching a small tin in her other hand. Addie, what's happening? Her head tilted up toward the skull, brushing the ceiling. What do you see? What do I see? Bags, woman, I see a bunch of bones come to life. The shoulder of the scrin hunched as the thing grew with the addition of more bones. More yet were sliding across the door toward it. Addie gaped at him. I don't see bones. I see flesh. Flesh? Bags? I thought you said you killed that thing. I said I've battled it. I do not know that a scrin can be killed. I do not think they be alive. You be right about one thing, wizard. Since you be able to defeat a screeling, the keeper sent worse. How did he know where we were? How does the scrin know where we are? All these bones are supposed to hide us. I do not know. I cannot understand how... A skeletal arm swept toward them. Zed lurched back, pulling her with him. Yet more bones assembled. Addie was frantically unscrewing the tin as he dragged her around the back of the table. The lid came off, dropping to the floor, spinning like a top. The scrin lunged, bringing an arm down. With a loud crack, the table shattered into splinters. The round, carved ball bounced across the floor. Zed tried to snatch it with a magic, but it was like trying to pinch a pumpkin seed with greased fingers. He tried to scoop it up with air compressed around it, but it slipped away and rolled into the corner. The scrin skeleton leapt at them. They both went down in a heap as he yanked her back. Zed hauled her to her feet as she thrust her hand into the little tin. The scrin was having trouble moving quickly. It had grown too large to fit beneath the ceiling. The jaws of the beast opened wide as if to roar. No sound came forth, but Zed could feel a blast of air. It made their robes flap and fly as if in a wind. Addie's hand came out of the tin, flinging sparkling white sand at the beast. Sorcerer's sand. The fool woman had sorcerer's sand. The scrin staggered back a step, shaking its head. It recovered in an instant, lurching forward again. Zed unleashed a ball of fire. It passed among the bones to splatter liquid flame against the far wall. The tongues of flame sputtered out, leaving behind a sooty splotch. Zed tried air, since fire didn't work. It had no effect. The two of them sidestepped across the room as the beast whirled to attack again. Zed tried different elements of magic while he pulled Addie along with him. She ignored the danger as she poured the rest of the sorcerer's sand into her hand. When the scrin made another silent roar, she flung the sand with a foreign incantation. 
The blast of air from the roar died as she spoke the words. The scrin seemed to inhale, taking in the sparkling white sand. The jaws snapped closed as the head drew back. That be all I have, she said. I hope it be enough. The scrin shook its head, then spat out the sand in a cloud of sparkles. It came for them again, but when he tugged on her sleeve, she yanked her arm away. Zed tried sending logs and chairs flying into the bone beast, trying to distract it while she scurried around behind it. They simply bounced off. Stabbing a hand into a pocket, he brought out a handful of sparkling dust of his own. With a quick flick, he sent it into the center of the bone collection standing before him. It had no more effect than had Addie's sorcerer's sand. Nothing he could do seemed to be much of a distraction, and it soon turned its attention to Addie. She was snatching an ancient bone from the wall. Feathers dangled from one end, strings of red and yellow beads from the other. Zed grabbed a bone arm, but the beast flung him away. As the scrin reeled to her, she shook the bone at the thing, casting spells in her own tongue. The scrin snapped at her. She yanked her hand back just in time to save it, but not the bone talisman. It was splintered in half. That was it. He had no idea how to fight the thing, and Addie wasn't having any success. He dove under the head toward her, rolling to his feet. Come on, we have to get out of here. I can't leave. There be things of great value here. Grab what you can. We're leaving. Get the round bone I showed you. Zed tried to dodge and lunge toward the corner, but the scrin snapped and swept talon-tipped claws at him. He fought back with blasts of every kind of magic he had. Before he realized it, he was losing ground and had nowhere to retreat. Addy, we have to get out now! We cannot leave that bone. It'd be important for the veil. She ran for the corner. Zed grabbed for her but missed. The scrin almost did too. It caught her with a claw, ripping a gash down her arm. She cried out as she was flung against the wall, rebounding to sprawl face down on the floor. More bones crashed down around her. Zed caught a handful of the hem of her robe, dragging her back as talons raked the wall, just missing his head. Addie clawed at the floor, trying to get away from him, to get to the round bone in the corner. The scrin reared back with a silent roar. The ceiling ripped open as the beast stood to its full height. Huge chunks and splinters of wood rained down. Claws raked wildly, tearing the wood of the walls. Fangs ripped at the roof. Zed pulled Addie toward the door as she fought him. There be things here I must take, important things. It has taken me a lifetime to find them. There's no time, Addie. We can't save them now. She tore away from his grasp, lunging toward the bone talismans on the wall. The scrin went for her. Zed used magic to yank her back. He grabbed her in both arms and fell backward with her through the doorway, just as a claw splintered it. They rolled to their feet. Zed scrambled into a run, pulling her along as she fought him. She tried using magic on him, but he shielded against it. The night air was frigid. Clouds of their breath streamed away with the cold wind as they both ran and fought each other. Addie wailed like a mother watching her child being slaughtered. Her arms, one soaked with blood, stretched toward the house. Please, my things. I must not leave them. You do not understand. They be important magic. The scrin tore at the walls to get out, to get at the two of them. Addie. He pulled her face close to his. They are no good to you, dead. We will come back for them after we get away from that thing. Her chest heaved. Tears welled up in her eyes. Please, Zed. Please. My bones. You don't understand. They be important. They have magic. They may help us to close the veil if they fall into the wrong hands. Zed whistled for the horse. He was moving again, pulling her along with him. She protested every step of the way. Zed, please, don't do this. Don't leave them. Addie, if we die, we can't help anyone. The horse galloped up, skidding to a stop. Her wide eyes rolled in near panic as she saw the thing pulling itself through the walls of the house, splintering and snapping boards and beams. She gave a frightened scream but held her ground as Zed gripped her mane and threw himself on her back, hauling Addie up behind. Go, fly like the wind, girl. Hooves flung chunks of dirt and moss high into the air as the horse leapt out, fangs snapping at her flanks. Zed crouched forward, Addie clutching him around the waist as they galloped into the darkness. The scrin wasn't ten strides behind and looked to be as fast as the horse. At least it wasn't faster. Zed could hear the teeth snapping. 
The horse squealed when they did, stretching to run with everything she had. He wondered who could run the longest, the horse or the scrin, and he was afraid he knew the answer. Chapter 24 Richard's eyes opened. I think someone is coming. Sister Verna was sitting on the other side of the small fire, writing in the little book she kept tucked behind her belt. She looked up from under her eyebrows. You have touched your Han, yes? No, he admitted. His legs ached. He must have been sitting without moving for at least an hour. But I'm telling you, I think someone is coming. They did this every night, and it was no different this time. He would sit and picture the sword on a blank background and try to reach that place within himself that she said was there, but he could not find, while she watched him or wrote in her little book or touched her own Han. He had not visualized the sword on a black square with a white border since the first night. He had no desire to chance revisiting that nightmare. I'm beginning to think I'm not able to touch my Han. I'm trying my best, but it just isn't working. She drew the book close to her face in the moonlight and resumed writing. I have told you before, Richard. It is something that takes time. You have not yet begun to have had enough patience. Do not be discouraged. It comes when it comes. Sister Verna, I'm telling you, someone is coming. She kept writing. And if you are not able to touch your Han, Richard, how would you know this, hmm? I don't know. He raked his fingers through his hair. I've spent a lot of time alone in the woods. Sometimes I can just feel when someone is near. Don't you ever know when someone is near? Haven't you ever felt someone's eyes on you? Only with the aid of my Han, she said as she wrote. He watched as firelight flickered across her dispassionate face. Sister Verna, you said we were in dangerous lands. I'm telling you, someone is coming. She leaped back through the book, squinting as she read in the dim light. And how long have you known this, Richard? I told you as soon as I had the feeling just a moment ago. She lowered the book to her lap and looked up. But you say you did not touch your Han. You felt nothing within yourself? You felt no power, saw no light? did not sense the Creator? Her eyes narrowed. You had better not be lying to me, Richard. You had better never lie to me about touching your Han. Sister Verna, you're not listening. Someone is coming. She closed the book. Richard, I have known since you began your practice that someone approaches. He stared at her in surprise. Then why are we just sitting here? We are not just sitting here. You are practicing reaching your Han, and I'm tending to my business. Why haven't you said anything? You told me this land is dangerous. Sister Verna sighed and began tucking her book back behind her wide belt. Because they were still some distance off. There was nothing else for us to do but to continue. You need the practice. You must keep trying until you are able to touch your Han. She shook her head with resignation. But I suppose you are too agitated now to continue. They are still ten or fifteen minutes away. We may as well begin packing our things. Why now? Why didn't we leave as soon as you sensed them? Because we had been spotted. Once we have been discovered, there is no way to escape these people. This is their land. We would not be able to outrun them. It's probably a sentinel who has found us. Then why do you want to pack to leave now? She regarded him as if he were hopelessly thick. Because we can't spend the night here after we kill them. Richard leapt to his feet. Kill them? You don't even know who is coming. And already you plan to kill them? Sister Verna stood, drawing herself up straight and peered into his eyes. Richard, I have done my best to prevent this. Have we seen anyone else before now? No. Even though these people cover this land like a swarm of angry ants, we have seen no one. I have led us between anyone I could sense with my Han in an effort to avoid contact. I have done my best to avoid trouble. Sometimes, even when you do your best, trouble cannot be avoided. I do not want to kill these people, but they are intent on killing us. That certainly explained why they had been traveling such a peculiar route. Although they had been heading steadily southeast for weeks, they had done so in an odd fashion. Without ever explaining, she had directed them first one way, then another, occasionally backtracking, but always relentlessly southeast. The barren land had become progressively rockier and more desolate. He had not bothered asking about their route because he didn't think she would tell him and because he didn't care. Wherever they went, he was still a prisoner. 
Richard scratched his new beard as he started kicking dirt over the fire. It was a warm night, as most had been lately. He wondered what had happened to Winter. We don't even know who they are yet. You can't just go killing anyone that shows up. Richard, she clasped her hands together. Not all the sisters who try to return are successful. Many are killed trying to cross these lands. In every case, there were three sisters. I am but one. Not good odds. The horse nickered and began moving about, tossing their heads and pawing their hooves. Richard strapped the baldric over his shoulder. He checked that the sword was clear in its scabbard. You were wrong, sister, not to try to get away as soon as you knew. If you have to fight, it should be because there is no other way. You didn't even try. Hands still clasped together, she watched him. Her voice was soft but firm. These people are intent upon killing us, Richard, both of us. If we had tried to run, this one would have alerted the others and brought hundreds, thousands, to bring us down. I have not run so as to embolden this one into trying to take us himself so we can end the threat. I'm not killing people for you, Sister Verna. As they glared at each other, he heard a scream, a woman's scream. He stared out into the night, trying to see into the shadows of the rocky spires, trying to see where the scream came from. He couldn't see anyone, but the screams and cries were coming closer. Richard kicked dirt over the last of the flames and sprinted to the horses, calming them with reassuring words and gentle strokes. He didn't care what she said. He wasn't killing people on her word. The woman was crazy not to want to try to escape. She probably wanted to fight just to see what he would do. She was always watching him, as if he were a bug in a box. She questioned him every time he practiced trying to touch his Han. Whatever the Han was, he hadn't been able to sense it, much less touch it or call it forth. Just as well, as far as he was concerned. Richard was starting toward the saddlebags to gather the rest of their things when a woman came running out of the night, cloak flying behind, and crying in terror, she ran headlong into their camp. She let out a wail and dashed desperately for him. Please, she cried out. Please help me. Please don't let them get me. Her loose hair streamed behind as she ran. The naked fear on her face ran a shiver up Richard's spine. She stumbled as she reached him. Richard caught her frail form in his arms. Her dirty face was streaked with sweat and tears. Please, sir, she sobbed, looking up at him with dark eyes. Please don't let them get me. You don't know what those men will do to me. Richard's mind filled with the fright of remembering Kaylin being pursued by the quads. He remembered how terrified she had been of those men and how she had spoken almost the same words. You don't know what those men will do to me. No one is going to get you. You are safe now. The woman's arms came out from under her cloak, slipping around him. Her dark eyes stayed on his as he held her weight. She opened her mouth as if to speak, but instead gave a little grunt and jerked. Light seemed to flash from within her eyes. She went slack and heavy in his arms. Richard looked up into Sister Verna's unwavering gaze as she yanked the silver knife from the woman's back. Richard felt himself letting the dead weight slip to the ground. The woman slumped fluidly and rolled onto her back. The night air rang with the sound of steel as Richard drew the sword. What's the matter with you, he hissed. You have just murdered this woman. Sister Verna returned his glare in kind. I thought you said you held no foolish prohibitions against killing women. The wrath of the sword's magic pounded through him, raging to be set free. You are mad. He was rushing toward a lethal precipice. The sword's point rose in anger. Before you would think to kill me, Sister Verna said in a measured tone, you had better make sure you are not making a mistake. Richard didn't answer. He was incapable of speaking through the fury. Look in her hand, Richard. He looked down at the lifeless body. Her hands were covered by her heavy woolen cloak. Using the sword, he flicked the cloak back off her arm to reveal a knife still gripped in her dead fist. The point had a dark stain on it. Did she scratch you with the knife? Richard's chest still heaved with anger. No. Why? Her knife is coated with poison. All it would take is a scratch. What makes you think it was meant for me? She was probably hoping to defend herself from the men who were chasing her. There are no men chasing her. She is a sentry. You are always telling me to stop treating you like a child, Richard. Stop acting like one. 
I know about these people, how they do things. She meant to kill us. He could feel the muscles in his jaw flex as he gritted his teeth. We could have tried to get away when she first spotted us. She nodded. Yes, and we would have died. I am telling you, Richard, I know these people. The wilds are layered like an onion with different peoples, all of whom will kill us if they find us. Had we let her reach her kind, they would have caught us and killed us. Don't let the anger of your sword close your eyes. She has a poison knife in her hand. She had it to your back, and she fell into your arms to be able to get close enough to use it. You foolishly let her do so. She turned a little and swept an arm behind. Where are the ones chasing her? She let the arm drop to her side. There is no one else. I could sense them with my Han if there were. She was alone. I have just saved your life. He drove the sword of truth back into its scabbard. You have done me no great favor, Sister Verna. He didn't know what to believe. He knew only that he was sick of magic and weary of death. What is that knife you keep up your sleeve? What's the light in their eyes when you kill with it? It's called a dakra. I guess it could be compared to the poison blade she was carrying. With the dakra, it's not the wound itself that kills. The dakra extinguishes the spark of life. Her eyes lowered. It's a painful thing to steal a life. Sometimes it is the only way. This tonight was the only way to save our lives, whether you choose to believe it or not. All I know, Sister Verna, is that you use it without hesitation and that you didn't even try anything else. He started to turn away. I'm going to bury her. Richard, she smoothed her skirt. I hope you understand, and that you don't misinterpret our actions. But when we reach the palace, we may have to take the sword of truth from you, for your own good. Why? How could that be for my own good? She clasped her hands together again. The prophecy that you have invoked, the one that says he is the bringer of death, and he shall so name himself, is a very dangerous prophecy. It goes on to say that the holder of the sword is able to call the dead forth, call the past into the present. What does that mean? We don't know. Prophecies, he muttered. Prophecies are just stupid riddles, sister. You invest too much concern in them. You admit that you don't understand them, yet try to follow them. Only a fool follows blindly what he doesn't understand. If it were true, I would call the dead forth and give this woman's life back to her. We know a lot more about them than you think. I believe it would be for the best if we took the sword, just for safekeeping, until we understand the prophecy better. Sister Verna, if someone took the Dakra from you, would you still be a sister? Of course, the Dakra is simply a tool to help us in our job. It doesn't make us who we are. He smiled a cold smile. It's the same with the sword. With or without it, I am still the seeker. I would be no less a danger to you. Taking it away from me will not save you. Her fists tightened. It is not the same. You are not taking the sword, he said flatly. You could never understand how much I hate this sword, hate its magic, and how much I wish to be rid of it. But it was given to me when I was named Seeker. It was given to me to be mine for as long as I wish to hold it. I am the Seeker. And I, not you or anyone else, will decide when I am to give it up. Her eyes narrowed. Named Seeker? You did not find the sword? Or purchase it? It was given by a wizard? You were named Seeker? A real seeker by a wizard? I was. Who was this wizard? The one I told you of before, Zedekus Zul Zarander. You met him just this once when he gave you the sword? No. I have spent my whole life with him. He practically raised me. He is my grandfather. There was a long moment of dead silence. And he named you seeker because he refused to teach you to control the gift to be a wizard? Refused? When he realized I have the gift, he practically begged to teach me to be a wizard. He offered, she whispered. That's right. I told him I didn't want to be a wizard. Something was wrong. She seemed disturbed by this news. He said the offer still stands. Why? She rubbed her hands absently. It is just unusual, that's all. Many things about you are unusual. Richard didn't know if he believed her. He wondered if maybe he didn't need the collar, if Zed could have helped him without it. But Kalen had wanted it on him. She had wanted him taken away. His insides twisted with that pain. The sword was the only thing he had of Zed, 
It was given to him when he was still back in Westland, when he was home. He missed his home, his woods. The sword was the only thing left of Zed and home. Sister, I was named Seeker and given this sword for as long as I wish to keep it and be Seeker. I will be the one to decide when the time has come to give it up. If you wish to take it away from me, then try to do it now. If you try, one of us is going to die in the attempt. At the moment, I don't much care which one of us it is, but I intend to fight to the death. It's mine by right, and you are not taking it as long as there is a breath of life in me. He listened to the distant howl of an animal dying a sudden violent death, and then to the long, empty silence that followed. Since you were given the sword, and did not simply find it or purchase it, you may keep it. I will not take it from you. I cannot speak for the others, but I will try to see to your wishes. It is the gift we must tend to. It is that magic we must teach you to control. She drew herself up and regarded him with an expression of such cold danger it made him have to fight the urge to shrink back. But if you ever again draw it against me, I will make you rue the day the Creator let you take your first breath. Her jaw muscles tightened. Do we understand each other? What's so important about me that you would kill to capture me? Her cold composure was more frightening than if she had yelled at him. Our job is to help those with the gift, because the gift is given by the Creator. We serve the Creator. It is for Him we die. I've lost two of my oldest friends because of you. I've wept myself to sleep with grief for them. I've had to kill this woman tonight, and I may have to kill others before we reach the palace. Richard had the feeling it would be best to keep quiet, but he couldn't. She had a way of stirring the coals of his anger to flame. Don't try to assuage your guilt over what you've done at my expense, sister. Her face heated with color that he could see, even in the moonlight. I've tried to be patient with you, Richard. I've given you leeway because you've been pulled from the only life you have known and been thrust into a situation you fear and don't understand. But my patience is near its end. I've tried my best not to see the lifeless bodies of my friends when I look into your eyes, or when you tell me I'm heartless. I've tried not to think about you being the one standing at their burial, not me, and about the things I would have said over their fresh graves. There are things going on that are beyond my understanding, beyond my expectations, beyond what I was led to believe. Were it up to me, I'm of a mind to grant you your wish and remove your Radahan and let you die in madness and pain. But it's not up to me. It is the Creator's work I do. Although the hot coals of his temper hadn't been doused, they had cooled. Sister Verna, I'm sorry. He wished she would scream at him. That would be better than her calm anger, her quiet displeasure. You are angered because you think I treat you as a child and not as a man, and yet you have given me no reason to do otherwise. I know where you stand in your abilities and where you have yet to travel. In that journey, you are no more than a babe who balls to be turned loose in the world, yet cannot even walk. The color you wear is capable of controlling you. It is also capable of giving you pain, great pain. Up until now, I have avoided using it, and have tried instead to encourage you in other ways to accept what must be done. But if I have to, I will use it. The Creator knows I've tried everything else. We will soon be in a land much more dangerous than this. We will have to deal with the people there to get through. The sisters have arrangements with them to be allowed to pass. You will do as I tell you, as they tell you. You will do the things you are told, or there will be a great deal of trouble. Richard's suspicion flared anew. What things? She glared at him. Do not test me further tonight, Richard. As long as you understand you're not getting my sword without a fight. We are only trying to help you, Richard. But if you draw a weapon on me again, I will see to it you greatly regret it. She glanced to the Aegeal hanging at his neck. Mord Sith hold no monopoly in giving pain. Cold confirmation of his suspicions spread through his gut. They intended to train him the way a Mord Sith trained him. That was the real reason for the collar. That was how they intended to teach him, with pain. For the first time he felt as if she had inadvertently let him see the bones of her intentions. She pulled the little book from her belt. I have some work to do before we leave. Go bury her, and hide her body well. If it's found, it will tell them what happened, and they will be after us, and then I will have killed for nothing. She sat in front of the cold jumble of firewood. With a smooth sweep of her hand over the dark coals, it burst into flame. 
After you've buried her, I want you to go for a walk and let your temper cool. Do not return until it is done so. If you try to wander away, or if you don't bring some reason into that thick head of yours by the time I'm ready to leave, I will bring you back by the collar. She gave him a menacing look from under her eyebrows. You will not like it if I have to do that. I promise you, you will not like it one bit. The dead woman was slight and little burden to carry. He hardly noticed the weight as he walked away from the camp into the low rocky hills. The moon was up and the way easy to see. His mind swirled with his brooding thoughts as he trudged alone, kicking an occasional stone. Richard was surprised at his pang of pain for Sister Verna. She had never before revealed how heartsick she was over the deaths of Sisters Grace and Elizabeth. He had thought that because she hadn't said anything, she was callous. He felt sorry for her now, sorry for her anguish. He wished she hadn't let him know. It was easier to rail against his situation when he thought she was heartless. He found himself a long way from their camp, at the crest of a hump of ground with rocky walls and spires rising around him. His mind came out of his twisting thoughts and returned to the body he carried on his back. Though the stab wound from the Dakra might not have been what had killed her, blood had nonetheless seeped down her back, matting her hair and soaking his shoulder. He felt sudden revulsion at carrying a dead woman around on his back. He laid the body gently on the rocky ground and looked about, searching for a place to lay her to rest. He had a small shovel hooked to his belt, but there didn't look to be easy digging anywhere. Maybe he could wall her up in one of the rocky crags. While he peered into the shadowed gullies, he absently rubbed the still sore burn on his chest. Nissel, the healer, had given him a poultice, and every day he spread it on before covering the wound once more with a bandage. He didn't like looking at it. He didn't like seeing the scar of a handprint burned into his flesh. Sister Werner had said it could have been that he had burned himself in the fireplace, in the spirit house, or that they might have indeed called forth the dark minions of the nameless one. It obviously wasn't a burn from the fire. It was the mark of the underworld, of dark and raw. He was somehow ashamed of it and never let Sister Verna see it. The scar was a constant reminder of his father's true identity, it seemed an affront to George Cipher, the man he thought of as his father, the man who had raised him, trusted and taught him, given him his love, and whom he had loved in return. The mark was also a constant reminder of the monster he really was, the monster Kalen had wanted collared and sent away. Richard swatted at a bug buzzing around his face. He looked down. They were buzzing around the dead woman, too. He went cold with a jolt of fright even before he felt the sting of a bite on his neck. Blood flies. He drew his sword in a rush as the huge dark shape lunged from behind the rock. The ringing sound of steel was drowned out by a roar. Wings spread wide. The guard dove for him. In an instant, he thought he saw a second hunched in the shadows behind the first, but his attention was immediately seized by the immense thing descending on him, by the fierce glowing green eyes locked on him. It was too big to be a long-tailed gar, and by the way it anticipated and avoided his first stab, too smart. It would have to be a short-tailed gar, he cursed silently. It was thinner than short-tailed gars he had seen before, probably the result of poor hunting in this desolate land, but thin or not, it was still huge, towering half again as tall as he. Richard stumbled and fell over the dead woman as he lurched back to escape the swipe of a massive claw. He came up swinging the sword in fury, letting the anger of the sword's magic surge through him. The tip of the sword sliced a gash across the smooth, taut pink stomach. The gar howled in rage as it rushed him again, unexpectedly batting him to the ground with a leathery wing. Richard rolled to his feet, whirling the sword as he came up. The blade flashed in the moonlight, taking off a wingtip in a spray of blood. That only enraged the gar into lunging toward him. Long, wet fangs ripped at the night air. Its eyes were ablaze with a furious green glow. The howling roar hurt his ears. Claws swept in to each side of him. The magic pounded through him, demanding blood. Instead of dodging the advance, Richard ducked. He sprang up, driving the sword through the chest of the great fur-covered beast. He yanked the blade back with a twisting cut to the sound of a scream of mortal pain. Richard pulled the sword behind, prepared to take the hideous head off with a powerful stroke, but the guard didn't come at him. Claws clutched to the gushing wound at its chest. It teetered a moment and then toppled heavily onto its back. 
bones in its wings snapping as it fell on them. A keening wail came from the shadows. Richard retreated a few paces. A small, dark form darted across the ground to the vanquished monster, falling on top of it, little wings wrapped around the heaving chest. Richard stared in disbelief. It was a baby gar. The wounded beast lifted a shaking claw to clutch weakly at the whimpering form. It drew a gurgling breath that lifted the little gar sprawled atop its chest. The arm dropped to the side. Faintly glowing green eyes drank in its little one and then looked up at Richard with pleading pain. A froth of blood bubbled as it expelled its last rattling breath. The glow in its eyes waned and then it was still. With plaintive cries, the little creature seized small fistfuls of fur. Little or not, Richard thought, it is still a gar. He stepped close. He had to kill it. The rage pounded through him. He lifted the sword over his head. The little gar drew a trembling wing over its head as it shrank back. As frightened as it was, it would not leave its mother. It whimpered in anguish and fear. A terrified little face peered over the trembling wing. Wide, wet green eyes blinked up at him. Tears ran down the deep creases in its cheeks as it sobbed in distress with a purling wail. Dear spirits, Richard whispered as he stood paralyzed. I can't do this. The little gar quivered as it watched the sword's point sink to the ground. Richard turned his back and closed his eyes. He felt sick, both from the sword's magic, which inflicted upon him the pain of his vanquished foe, and from the dreadful prospect of what he had been ready to do. As he replaced the sword, he drew a deep breath to steady himself, then lifted the dead woman over his shoulder and started off. He could hear the choking sobs of the little gar as it clung to its still mother. He couldn't kill it. He just couldn't. Besides, he told himself, the sword wouldn't allow it. The magic only worked against threat. It wouldn't allow him to kill the little gar. He knew it wouldn't. Of course, it would work if he turned the blade white, but he couldn't bear that pain. He would not subject himself to that agony, not for no more purpose than to kill a defenseless pup. He carried the dead woman's body toward the next rise as he listened to the whimpers grow faint. Laying the body down again, he sat to catch his breath. He could just see the great beast in the moonlight, a dark blotch against the light-colored rock and the small form atop it. He could hear the slow sounds of anguish and confusion. Richard sat a long time watching, listening. Dear spirits, what have I done? The spirits, as usual, had nothing to say. Out of the corner of his eye, movement caught his attention. Two distant silhouettes passed in front of the big, bright moon. They banked into a slow turn and began to descend. Two gars. Richard came to his feet. Maybe they would see the baby and help it. He found himself cheering them on and then realized how absurd it was to hope a gar would live but he was beginning to feel an odd sympathy for monsters. Richard ducked down. The two guards overhead came close to him as they swept in a wide circle around the scene on the next hill. Their spiral tightened. The little gar fell silent. The dark shapes dove down, landing a ways apart with a flutter of wings. They moved cautiously around the dead gar and its offspring. Wings held open. They suddenly leapt toward the silent baby gar. It broke its silence with a scream, there was a flurry of wings, vicious roars, and frightened shrieks. Richard stood. Many animals ate the young of another of their own kind, especially males, and especially if food was scarce. They weren't going to save it. They intended to eat it. Before he even realized what he was doing, Richard was racing down the hill. He ran, heedless of the foolishness he intended. He pulled the sword free as he charged up the hill to the little gar. Its terrified wails urged him on, the savage snarls of its attackers ignited the wrath of the sword's magic. Steel first, he rushed into the fur and claw and wings. The two guards were bigger than the one he had killed, confirming his suspicion that they were males. His blade caught only air as they leapt back, but one of them dropped the little gar. It skittered across the ground and clutched its mother's fur. The other two circled him, charging and darting and swiping with their claws. Richard swung and stabbed with the sword. One of them snatched at the baby. Richard scooped it away with his free arm and quickly retreated a dozen paces. They fell on the dead gar. With a cry, the baby stretched its arms toward its mother, its wings flapping against his face in an effort to free itself. 
In a frenzy, the two guards tore at the carcass. Richard made a calculated decision. As long as the dead gar was there, the pup wouldn't leave it. The pup would have a better chance of survival if it had nothing to hold it to this place. It squirmed mightily in his arm. Though fully half his size, at least it was lighter than he would have thought. He feigned a charge to hurry the two along. They snapped at him, too hungry to be frightened off without a meal. They fought each other. Claws slashed and pulled, ripping the body asunder. Richard charged again as the little gar tore free, running ahead of him with a shriek. The two leapt into the air, each with half a prize. In a moment, they were gone. The little gar stood where its mother had been, keening as it watched the two disappear into the dark sky. Panting and weary, Richard returned his sword to its scabbard and then slumped down on a short ledge, trying to catch his breath. His head sunk into his hands as tears welled up. He must be losing his mind. What in the world was he doing? He was risking his life for nothing. No, not for nothing. He raised his head. The little gar was standing in the blood where its mother had been. Its trembling wings held out limply. Its shoulders slumped and its tufted ears wilted. Big green eyes watched him. They stared at each other for a long moment. I'm sorry, little one, he whispered. It took a tentative step toward him. Tears ran down the gar's face. Tears ran down his. It took another small, shaky step. Richard held his arms out. It watched, and then with a miserable wail, fell into them. It clutched its long, skinny arms to him. Warm wings wrapped around his shoulders. Richard hugged it tightly to himself. Gently stroking its coarse fur, he hushed it with comforting whispers. Richard rarely had seen a creature in such misery, a creature so in need of comfort that it would even accept it from the one who had caused its pain. Maybe, he thought, it was only recognizing him as the one who had saved it from being eaten by two huge monsters. Maybe, given the terrible choice, it chose to see him as a savior. Maybe the last impression of saving it from being eaten was simply the strongest. The little gar felt like nothing more than a furry sack of bones. It was half starved. He could hear its stomach grumbling. Its faint musky odor, while not pleasant, was not repulsive either. He cooed sucker as the thing's whimpering slowed. When it had at last quieted with a heavy, tired sigh, Richard stood. Sharp little claws tugged at his pant leg as it looked up to his face. He wished he had some food to leave with the pup, but he hadn't brought his pack and had nothing to offer. He pulled the claw from his pants. I have to go. Those two won't come back now. Try to find yourself a rabbit or something. You'll have to do the best you can on your own now. Go on. It blinked up at him, its wings and one leg slowly stretching as it yawned. Richard turned and started off. He looked over his shoulder. The little gar followed after. Richard stamped to a halt. You can't come with me. He held his arms out and shooed it away. Go on. Be off with you. He started walking backward. The gar followed. He stopped again and shooed it more firmly. Go. You can't come with me. Go on. The wings wilted again. It took a few shaking steps back as Richard started off again. This time it stayed put as he went on his way. Richard had the woman's body to bury, and he needed to get back to camp before Sister Verna decided to use the collar to bring him back. He had no desire to give her an excuse. He knew she would find one soon enough. He glanced behind to make sure the gar hadn't followed. He was alone. He found the body, laid on its back where he had left it. He noted with relief that there were no blood flies about. He had to find either a patch of ground soft enough to dig a hole, or else a deep crevice of some sort to hide her body in. Sister Verna had been explicit about hiding it well. As he was surveying the scene, there was a soft flutter of wings, and the little gar thumped to the ground nearby. He gave a quiet lament as the creature folded its wings and squatted comfortably before him, peering up with big green eyes. Richard tried to shoo it away again. It didn't move. He put his hands on his hips. You can't come with me. Go away. It tottered to him and clutched his legs. What was he going to do? He couldn't have a gar tagging after him. Where are your flies? You don't even have any blood flies of your own. How can you expect to catch your dinner without your own blood flies? He gave a rueful shake of his head. Well, it's not my concern. 
The small wrinkled face peeked around his legs. A low growl came from its throat as its lips pulled back to reveal sharp little fangs. Richard looked around. It was growling at the dead woman. He closed his eyes with a groan. The pup was hungry. If he buried the body, the gar would dig it up. Richard watched as the gar hopped over to the body, pawing at it as its growls grew louder. Richard tried to swallow back the dryness in his throat, or maybe the things he was thinking. Sister Verna had said to get rid of the body. They mustn't know how the woman had died, she had said. He couldn't stand the thought of the remains being eaten, but even if he buried it, it would be eaten anyway by worms. Why were worms better than a gar? Another ghastly thought came to him. Who was he to judge? He had eaten human flesh. Why was that any different? Was he any better? And besides, if the pup was busy eating, he could be off, and they would be gone before it had time to follow. It would be on its own then. He would be rid of it. Richard watched as the little gar cautiously inspected the body. It experimentally tugged at an arm with its teeth. The pup wasn't experienced enough to know what to do with a kill. It growled louder. The sight made Richard sick. The teeth dropped the arm and the gar looked at him, as if to ask for help. The wings fluttered with excitement. It was hungry. Two problems at once. What difference did it make? She was dead. Her spirit had departed her body and wouldn't miss it. It would solve two problems at once. Gritting his teeth at the task in mind, he drew the sword. Pushing back the hungry gar with a leg, Richard took a mighty swing, slashing open a great rent. The little gar pounced. Richard walked quickly away without looking back. The sounds turned his stomach. Who was he to judge? Light-headed, he broke into a trot back to the camp. Sweat soaked his shirt. The sword had never felt so heavy at his hip. He tried to put the whole incident out of his head. He thought about the Heartland Woods and wished he were home. He wished he could still be who he had once been. Sister Verna had just finished currying Jessup and was lifting on his saddle. She eyed him with a sidelong glance before moving to her horse's head, speaking softly and privately to him as she scratched his chin. Richard took up the curry comb and brushed quickly at Geraldine's back, cautioning her sharply to stand still and quit turning around. He wanted to be away quickly. Did you make sure they wouldn't find the body? His hand with the comb froze on Geraldine's flanks. If they find what's left, they won't know what happened. I was attacked by guards. They got the body. She thought this over silently for a moment. I thought I heard Gars. Well, I guess that will do. He went back to brushing as she spoke again. Did you kill them? I killed one. He considered not telling her, but decided it didn't matter. There was a baby Gar. I didn't kill it. Gars are murderous beasts. You should have killed it. Perhaps you should go back and finish it. I can't. It won't let me get close enough. With a little grunt, she pulled the girth strap tight. You have a bow. What difference does it make? Let's just be off. All by itself, it will probably die anyway. She bent, checking that the strap wasn't pinching her horse. Perhaps you're right. It would be best if we were away from here. Sister, why haven't the guards bothered us before? Because I shield against them with my Han. You were too far away, beyond my shields, and so they came for you. So this shield will keep all guards away from us? Yes. Well, at least there was one thing the Han was good for. Doesn't that take a lot of power? Gars are big beasts. Isn't it hard? The question brought a small smile to her lips. Yes, Gars are big, and there are other beasts I must shield against, too. All this would take much power. You must always search for the way to accomplish the task using the least amount of Han. She stroked her horse's neck as she went on. I keep the Gars away, not by repelling the beasts themselves, but by shielding against their blood flies. It's much easier. If the flies can't get through the shield, the gars won't think there is anything worthwhile, and so won't come to us either. It uses little of my strength this way, yet achieves my aim. Why didn't you use this shield against the people here, against the woman tonight? Some of the people in the wilds have charms against our power. That's why many sisters die trying to cross. If we knew how these charms or spells worked, we might be able to counter them, but we don't. It's a mystery to us. Richard finished saddling Geraldine and Bonnie in silence. The sister waited patiently. He thought she had more to say about their argument before he had gone to bury the woman, but she remained silent. 
he decided to speak first and get it over with. Sister Verna, I'm sorry about Sisters Grace and Elizabeth. He idly stroked Bonnie's shoulder as he studied the ground. I said a prayer over their graves. I just wanted you to know that. A prayer to the good spirits to watch over them and treat them well. I didn't want them to die. You may think otherwise, but I don't want anyone to die. I'm sick of death. I can't even eat meat anymore because I can't stand the thought of anything having to die just to feed me. Thank you for the prayer, Richard. But you must learn that it is only the Creator we must pray to. It is His light that guides. Praying to spirits is heathenish. She seemed to think better of her harsh tone and softened it. But you are unschooled and would not know that. I can't fault you for doing the best you could. I'm sure the Creator heard your prayer and understood its benevolent intent. Richard didn't like her narrow-minded attitude. He thought that perhaps he knew more about spirits than she did. He didn't know much about this Creator of hers, but he had seen spirits before, both good and bad. He knew you ignored them at your own peril. Her dogma seemed as foolish to him as the superstitions of the country people he knew when he had been a guide. They had been full of stories of how people came to be. Each remote area he had visited had its own version of man created from this or that animal or plant. Richard had liked listening to the stories. They were filled with wonder and magic, but they were just stories, rooted in a need to understand how the teller fit into the world. He was not going to accept on faith the things the sisters said. He did not think that the Creator was like some king, sitting upon a throne listening to every petty prayer to come his way. Spirits had been alive once, and they understood the needs of mortals, understood the exigencies of living flesh and blood. Zed had taught him that the Creator was simply another name for the force of balance in all things, and not some wise man sitting in judgment. But what did it matter? He knew people held tightly to their doctrines and were close-minded about it. Sister Verna believed what she did, and he wasn't going to change it. He had never faulted people for the beliefs they held. He was not about to start now. Such beliefs, true or not, could be a bomb. He pulled the baldric off over his head and held the sword out to her. I thought about the things you said before. I've decided I don't want the sword anymore. Her hands came up, and he laid the weight of the sword, scabbard, and baldric in them. She showed no emotion. Do you really mean this? He nodded. I do. I am finished with it. The sword is yours now. He turned to check his saddle. Even without the sword at his hip, he could still feel the tingle of its magic. He could give up the sword, but the magic was still within him. He was the true seeker and could not be rid of that. At least he could be rid of the blade and thereby the things he did with it. You are a very dangerous man, Richard, she whispered. He looked back over his shoulder. That's why I'm giving you the sword. I don't want it any longer, and you do, so it's yours. We'll see how you like killing with it. He tugged the end of the girth strap, threw the buckle, and drew it tight. He gave Bonnie a gentle pat before turning around. Sister Verna was still holding out the sword. Until now, I had no idea just how dangerous you are. Not anymore. You have the sword now. I cannot accept it, she whispered. It was my duty to take the sword from you when you came back, to test you. There was only one thing you could have done to prevent losing it, and you have done it. She lifted the sword to him. There is no man more dangerous than one who is unpredictable. There is no way to forecast what you will do when pushed. It is going to be great trouble for you, for us. Richard didn't know what she was talking about. There's nothing unpredictable about it. You wanted the sword, and I'm weary of the things I do with it, so I gave it to you. You understand, because it is the way you think. Others don't think that way. You're an enigma. Worse, your inexplicable behavior comes at the times you need it most. That is the gift at work. You're using your Han without understanding what you are doing. That is dangerous. One reason for the caller is to open my mind to the gift. That's what you said. If I'm using the gift, which is what you want me to do, and if it is what I need, then I don't see how that is dangerous. What you need and what's right are not necessarily the same. Just because you want something, that does not make it right. She nodded to the sword. Take it back. I cannot accept it now. You must keep it. I told you I don't want it. Then throw it in the fire. I cannot take it. It's tainted. Richard snatched it out of her hands. I'm not throwing it in the fire. He put his head through the baldric and straightened the scabbard at his hip. 
I think you're too superstitious, sister. It's just a sword. It is not tainted. She was wrong. It was the magic that was tainted, and he had not offered that to her. Even if he wanted to be rid of its magic, all magic, he could not. It was part of him. Kaylin had seen that, and she had rid herself of it, of him. She turned from him and mounted Jessup. Her voice was cold and distant. We must be on our way. Richard settled into his saddle and followed after. He hoped the little gar would have a chance at life after the meal it had needed. He said a silent goodbye to it as he rode into the night behind Sister Verna. Though he had meant what he said about giving her the sword, he felt strangely relieved to have it back. It belonged with him and somehow made him whole. Zed had given it to him. It was what had changed him, but it was also all he had to remind him of his friend and home. Chapter 25 the horse was exhausted, but still ran with wild abandon. Addie held a tight grip on Zed's waist as he leaned over the horse's withers, clutching her mane. Muscles bunched and flexed rhythmically beneath him. Trees in the dense forest flashed by in an endless blur. The horse leapt over rocks and logs without pause. The screen was only a heartbeat behind. Being taller than the horse, it struck branches as it ran. Zed could hear the limbs snap and splinter. He had tried felling trees across the way right behind them, but it didn't slow the bone beast. He had tried tricks and spells and wizardry of every sort. None had worked, but he refused to admit defeat. Admitting defeat established a mental state of resignation that would make it certain. I fear the keeper has us this time, Addie called at his back. Not yet he doesn't. How did he find us? The bones of this scrim have been in your house hiding you for years. If they have been hiding you, then how did he find us? She had no answer. They were running the path where the boundary had been, headed toward the Midlands. Zed was thankful the boundary walls were no longer there, or they could have inadvertently run into the underworld by now. Boundary or not, this couldn't go on for much longer, and then the scrim would have them. Boundary or not, the underworld would have them. The keeper would have them think, he ordered himself. Zed was using magic to lend strength and stamina to the horse, but even so, hearts, lungs, and sinew could not endure long past their natural limits. He was nearly as weary as the frightened animal. This couldn't go on much longer. He had to stop trying to slow the screen and put his mind to solving the problem, but that could be a dangerous shift in tactics. It could be that although what he was doing wasn't stopping the screen, it was keeping it from them. He thought he saw a flash of green light to the left, a shade of green he had seen from only one place, the boundary, from the underworld. Impossible, he thought. The horse's hooves thundered on. Addie, do you have anything with you that the screen would recognize? Like what? I don't know anything. It has to have found us by something, something to connect us to the underworld. I have nothing. It must have found us by the bones at my house. But the bones have been what have been hiding you. There was no mistaking the flash of green light this time. It was to the right. Another came to the left. Zed, I think this screen be bringing up the underworld to force us into it. Bones. Can it do that? Her voice wasn't as loud this time. Yes. Bags, he muttered into the cold wind at his face. Eerie green light flickered between the trees. It was closer. If he didn't think of something, they were going to die. Think. Suddenly, the green light seemed to ignite into a solid wall to each side. It made a thump he could feel deep in his chest when it arrived, whole in this world. The horse galloped down the path between them. The way between the walls was narrowing. Bones. Scrin bones. Addy. Give me the necklace around your neck. The luminous green walls of the boundary pressed into each side. They were out of time. They were out of options. Addie pulled off her necklace and put her arm around him again, holding out the bone necklace. Her hand was slick with blood. Zed yanked his own necklace over his head and snatched hers in the same hand. If this doesn't work, I'm sorry, Addie. I just want you to know I've enjoyed sharing time with you. What are you going to do? Hold tight! The green walls of the boundary closed together ahead of them. Zed held the horse firmly and gave her a silent command. 
she dug in her hooves and spun around to a halt just before the trail ended in a wall of the underworld. Zed flung the two necklaces made with scrin bone into the green light between a wide gap in the trees. The scrin was upon them. Without pause, it followed the necklaces as they sailed into the boundary into the green light. There was a flash and a booming clap like a lightning strike as the scrin went through. The green light and the scrin flickered and were gone. The dark forest was silent but for ragged breathing. Addy laid her head wearily against his back. You'll be right, old man. Your life be one act of desperation after another. Zed patted her knee before sliding off the sweaty horse. The poor animal was so exhausted it was at the brink of death. Zed held its head between his hands and gave it a dose of strength and his sincere thanks. He laid the side of his face against her nose as he closed his eyes and gave reassuring strokes to her cheeks for a moment before going to check on Addie. Blood still oozed from the wound on her arm. The size of the horse made Addie appear smaller than she really was. Her slumped shoulders and hanging head didn't help diminish the illusion. She didn't acknowledge any pain as Zed inspected the wound. I be a fool, she said. The whole time I thought I'd be hiding under the keeper's nose, he'd be hiding under mine. He knew where I be the whole time, all these years. We can take solace in the fact that it earned him no profit. He has wasted his investment. Now hold still. I must tend to this wound. There be no time for that. We must get back to my house. I must get my bones. I said be still. We must hurry. Zed scowled up at her. We will go back when I'm finished, but the horse is exhausted. She must be walked. I'll walk and let you ride, if you give me no further trouble. Now be still, or we will be here the whole night quibbling. By the time they reached Addie's house, dawn was breaking, offering a cold, weak light. It was a sad sight. The scrin had torn the place to splinters. Addie disregarded the leaning, hold walls as she rushed inside, stepping over debris, picking up bones, holding them in the crook of her other arm as she worked her way toward the corner where they had last seen the round, carved bone. Zed was inspecting the ground outside when he heard her calling to him. Come help me find the round bone, wizard. He stepped over a fallen beam. I don't expect you will find it. She pushed a board aside. It be here somewhere. She stopped looking back over her shoulder. What do you mean you don't expect we will find it? Someone has been here. She looked around at the ruin. You be sure? Zed waved his arm vaguely toward where he had been studying the ground. I saw a footprint over there. It isn't ours. She let the bones in her arm drop to the floor. Who? He laid his hand on a beam that hung from the ceiling, its end resting on the floor. I don't know, but someone has been here. It looks to be a woman's boot, but it isn't yours. I suspect she will have taken the round bone. Addie pawed through the rubble in the corner, searching. At last, she stopped. You be right, old man. The bone be gone. She turned, seeming to inspect the very air with her white eyes. Banelings, she hissed. You be wrong about the keeper wasting his effort. I fear you're right. Zed brushed his hand clean on the side of his leg. We had better get away from here, far away. Addie leaned toward him, her voice low but firm. Zed, we must have that bone. It be important for the veil. She has covered her trail with magic. I don't have any idea where she went. I only saw one footprint. We must be away from here. The keeper might expect us to return. I'll cover our trail also, so no one will know where we're going. You be so sure of that? The keeper seems to know where we be and sends his minions for us at will. He tracked us by the necklaces we wore. He will be blind to us for the time being. But we must get away from here. He may have eyes watching, the same eyes that took the bone. Her head sunk lower as she closed her eyes. Forgive me, Zed, for endangering you so, for being a fool. Nonsense. No one knows everything. You can't expect to walk through life without stepping in the muck now and again. The important thing is to maintain your footing when you do and not fall on your face and make it worse. But that bone be important. It's gone. We can do nothing about it now. At least we foiled the keeper. He didn't get us. But we must be away from here. Addie bent to pick up the bones she had dropped. I will hurry. We can't take anything, Addie. 
he said quietly. She straightened. I must take my bones. Some of them be important. Some have powerful magic. Zed took up her thin hand. Addy, the Keeper knew where we were by one of the bones. He's been watching you. We can't know if he would recognize any of these, too. We must leave them. But we can't risk having someone else taking them. They must be destroyed. Her mouth worked for a moment before she found words. I will not leave them. They be important. They were extremely difficult to obtain. It took me years to find some of them. The Keeper could not have marked them. He could not know the trouble I went to. Zed patted her hand. Addy, he wouldn't have placed one he wanted you to have to mark you right in your path. He would have made you struggle for it, so you would value it and keep it close. She yanked her hand back. Then he could have marked anything, she pointed. How do you know this horse was not given by a baneling? Zed gave her a level look. Because it was not the one offered. I took another. Tears welled up in her eyes. Please, Zed, she whispered. They be mine. They be how I was going to reach my pal. I will help you get your message to your pal. I have given you my word. But this is not the way to do it. It hasn't worked yet. I'll help you find a new way. She limped a step closer to him. How? He regarded her stricken face with sympathy. I have a way to bring spirits through the veil for a brief time to speak with them. Even if I can't bring Pell through, I might be able to get a message to him. But, Addy, you must listen to me. We can't do it now. We must wait until the veil is closed. Her trembling fingers touched his arm. How? How can such a thing be done? It can be done. That is all you must know. Tell me. Her fingers tightened on his arm. I must know you speak the truth. I must know it can be done. He weighed the decision a long moment. He had used the wizard's rock his father had given him to call the spirits of his father and mother to himself, but they had told him explicitly not to call them again until this was finished, or they would risk tearing the veil apart. Using the rock in such a fashion was dangerous, even in the best of times, and he had been cautioned not to do it except in the gravest circumstances. Opening a path to the spirits was always a great risk. You never knew what you would be letting through, unintended. Enough dark things were getting through without his helping them. Even though Addie was a sorceress, this use of the wizard's rock was not for her to know. It was a secret, like many others, that wizards must keep. His heart felt heavy with that responsibility. You will have to trust my word that it can be done. I've given my word that I'll help you, and when it's safe, I'll try. Her fingers still dug urgently into his arm. How can such a thing be? Are you sure? How could you know such a thing? He straightened his shoulders. I am a wizard of the first order. But are you sure? Addy, you must take my word. I don't give it lightly. I'm not sure it will work, but I believe it may. Right now, the important thing is to use what we know, what you and I know, to stop the Keeper from tearing the veil. It would be wrong to use what I know for selfish reasons, and thus endanger the safety of everyone else. Maintaining the veil requires a delicate balance of forces. This could disturb it. It could even be that such a use would tear the veil. She took her hand from his arm and wiped a stray strand of gray hair from her face. Forgive me, Zed. You'll be right. I have studied the cusp between the worlds for most of my life. I should know better. Forgive me. He smiled as he hugged her around her shoulders. I'm gratified that you hold your vows to be so important. It means that you are a person of honor. There's no better ally than a person of honor. She looked around her shattered home. It just be that I have spent my life gathering these things. I have been their caretaker for so long. Others have entrusted them to me. Zed walked her out of the rubble. Others have invested their trust in you to use the gift you were given to protect those without power. They are the ones who wrote the prophecies. You have been brought to this point for a reason. That's the trust you must keep. She nodded, rubbing a thin hand on his back as they walked away from the remains of her home. Zed, I think several other bones be missing too. I know. They be dangerous in the wrong hands. I know that too. Then what do you plan to do about it? 
I plan to do what the prophecies say is the only thing that gives us a chance at closing the veil. And what be that, old man? Helping Richard. We must find a way to help him, for the prophecies say he is the only one who can close the veil. Neither looked back as fire roared to life, roiling and racing through the ruins, dancing through the bones. Chapter 26 Queen Cyrilla held her head high. She refused to acknowledge how much the coarse fingers of the brutes who held her were hurting her arms. She didn't resist as they walked her down the filthy corridor. Resistance was hopeless anyway, and would bring her no aid. She would conduct herself now as always, with dignity. She was the Queen of Galia. She would endure with dignity what was to come. She would not show her terror. Besides, it was not what was being done to her that mattered. It was what was going to happen to the Galean people that grieved her, and what had already happened. Nearly one hundred score of the Galean guard had been murdered before her eyes. Who could have foreseen that they would be set upon in this, of all places, on neutral ground? That a few had escaped was no solace. They, too, would probably be hunted down and killed. She hoped that her brother, Prince Harold, had been among those who had escaped. If he had gotten away, perhaps he could rally a defense against the worse slaughter that was yet to come. 